the guy stands in front of a goddess floating in the air. He asks in surprise. The guy asks the goddess that she is offering him reincarnation. The goddess answers him yes. The cause of his death was simply pathetic. Therefore, the guy's new life will be determined using this machine. The guy thinks that he doesn't see anything good in this situation. The guy tells the lady goddess that he can't remember how he died. She tells the guy that this happens sometimes. In any case, they should already start choosing. The guy comes up to the machine and says okay. Then he gets a golden ball from the machine. This is a super rare opportunity. The guy opens the ball and takes out a piece of paper that says, Decomposition of Toxins. He asks the goddess what it is. The goddess answers the guy that this is a skill. It is strong against toxins and can easily destroy any bacteria or viruses. The guy shouts in anger about what a terrible skill he got. The goddess continues, telling the guy that the world where he will be reborn will be like a fantasy. There will be statuses, magic and monsters. The goddess tells the guy that she asks him to enjoy life to the fullest, but the guy shouts that this transfer is all too sudden. He only manages to loudly call the goddess, but he is absorbed by a bright light. He sits at the castle table with his head on the table. The guy's hand starts to shake. He opens his eye. It turns out to be a small dark-haired child. He opens his eye and thinks that what he saw was a dream. He scratches his head and says that five years have passed. He has a headache. A child drinks water from a glass and thinks about his skill, decomposition of toxins. His skill allows him to kill any viruses and bacteria. For the first time, the hero decided to test it for mold, and his actions successfully killed the bacteria. The boy leans back in his chair, thinking that after using his skill he begins to have a severe headache. Is it a side effect or not? He really got a useless skill. The boy clenches his fist, saying that he will not use this skill again. And then the boy jumps up from his chair and runs somewhere, saying that he forgot about his training with his father. The boy runs to the training ground. The father tells the boy that he has become better at wielding a sword. He answers his father yes, saying thank you very much. This is the boy's father. His name is Logan. He is the great commander of the largest kingdom on the continent. The Reinhardt family, into which the main character was born, controls the area around the port near the capital, and this has a great influence on it. The boy is sure that he was born into the Count's family only because of his rare skill. Someone's calling Logan. This is Camilla and Grint, who came with her. Camille tells Logan that preparations for Grint's training are complete. He answers her with a smile, that's how it is. Logan pats Grint on the head and says that he looks great in his armor and looks like a real knight. The boy happily tells him yes. Logan tells the other boy, addressing him as Ein, that he will help Grint with training and let him continue practicing with the sword. Ein bows his head and says that he understands. Before leaving, Grint looks at him and smiles. Ein looks at Logan, Camilla and Grint leaving, the three of them walking away smiling. Grint is the son of his father's second wife. Ein and Grint are only half-blood brothers and he is one year younger than him, and his younger brother has just an excellent skill. While Ein, the older brother, has the useless toxin decomposition skill, his younger brother has a skill that has only appeared in a couple of people in the entire history of the Kingdom of Heim. This is a skill called Holy Knight. Ein waves his sword, thinking that it's not that his father was a bad person. These are the rules that if you compare him and Grint, he is more promising. Ein holds the sword, thinking that but in truth, all this is so disappointing to him. Then Ein notices the armor. One of the knights shouts to Ein, addressing him as a young master, that this effigy is made of metal. Now it is impossible for Ein to wrinkle such armor. Ein thinks it is impossible to do this. That is why. Ein rushes with his sword at the armor, thinking that he will be able to crush the armor, then his father will notice him. Ein hits the armor without causing any harm and receives the recoil and flies back. Ein falls to the ground and screams that he is in pain. The knight tells Ein that didn't he tell him it was impossible. Ein looks at his shaking hands. Ein walks down the corridor and thinks that he cannot give up just because of the difference in talent. 
Ein thinks that if he wants to surprise his father and mother, then he must try even harder than others. Ein sits and studies books for this purpose. Then a servant comes to him and tells the young master that dinner is coming soon. The servant notices that Ein is surrounded by a mountain of books. Ein asks for forgiveness, saying that he was too busy studying. The servant tells Ein that there is nothing to apologize for, the young master's action is worthy of praise. Ein not only trains every day, but also studies hard. Every butler on the estate is confident that Ein could easily become a scientist. Even becoming a general is no longer impossible. Ein smiles and tells the butler that he hopes what he said is true. Then the butler remembers that the lady told him that she would soon be free. Ein screams in shock that his mom is here. He is completely beaming with happiness. The butler asks Ein that he will go right now. Ein replies that yes, he will do so. Ein adjusts his collar and knocks on the door, asking if mom is there. A voice from behind the door answers him yes, come in. Ein enters the room and there is a girl sitting there who tells Ein welcome with a smile. The girl's name is Olivia, and she is his mother. But because Ein remembers his past life, Olivia is more like an older sister to him than a mother. Olivia reaches out to him, and then Olivia hugs Ein. Olivia smiles and tells Ein that he smells like books. He works out so hard every day. Olivia pats Ein on the head and tells him he's such a good boy. Ein doesn't know why, but it really confuses him. Ein sits down next to Olivia on the sofa and tells her that he heard that she finished working. Olivia tells him yes, but because she worked, she had a lot of things left to do. She laid out the documents and thought about what she should do. Ein looks at mom and thinks that dad is not connected with her work. But to deal with so many documents, what was expected of a girl working in a large trading company? Ein thinks that he just needs to see how beautiful his mother is. Olivia stands up and says that she remembered that she has something for Ein. She hands him a gift, saying that he has been waiting for this for so long. But she just arrived. Ein looks at the item in his hands in shock, saying that this is... This is a status card. Ein says thank you so much to mom. Olivia laughs, telling Ein she's glad he liked it. Ein says that he doesn't understand whether his status is bad or not. Olivia tells Ein that she heard that kids his age have about 10 stamina points. Ein says that if that's the case, Ein thinks that thank God, his status is not that bad. But then Ein notices a line on the panel, the gift of learning. He doesn't understand what it is. Olivia tells Ein that this is a skill that reduces his fatigue and allows him to better tolerate pain. This proves that Ein is doing everything to become a better person. And Olivia knows this better than anyone. Ein says mom gratefully. Olivia immediately says that she definitely still has an order from her grandmother. How about we go for a walk together? They haven't done this for so long. Ein does not understand what kind of order this is from his grandmother. Olivia tells Ein that grandma wants them to buy the tea they usually drink from the merchant. Ein tells Olivia that isn't what servants do. Why should mommy? Olivia replies that maybe grandma thinks she has good taste. Ein doesn't know what to say, and then he bows his head and thinks that it's all his fault. Because of him, mom has to go through this. This all happens because Ein is not suitable for the role of the eldest son. Mom takes him by the hand. Olivia asks Ein if he minds joining her. She calls Ein her great knight. Ein smiles and tells his mom that yes of course. He will go with her. Later, Olivia comes to a man who asks her if it is her. Olivia says she came to buy tea and can he show her some varieties. The man stands up and tells Olivia that yes of course. Olivia takes the teas and looks. Then Ein notices a box with magic stones of power. The man says Ein is right about whether he is interested in the stones. Magic stones are usually located in the bodies of monsters, their magic crystallizes in the stone. They have many uses, from being used in magical rituals to making accessories. High-quality stones can contain a huge accumulation of magic that harms the body. But this is a cheap kernel that is used to create tools. Nothing will happen to a person, even if he touches the stone with his bare hands. Ein takes the stone in his hands and says thank you. Olivia asks if she can ask a question. 
The man answers her yes, but what is it? Ein looks at the stone and thinks that it smells so sweet, as if it were honey. Ein holds a stone in his hands and thinks that it might taste like candy. Ein thinks that no, he needs to stop. He had never heard of magic stones being licked. Although he is only five years old in this world, he has definitely not heard of such a thing. Ein decides to lick the stone just once while no one is looking. Ein licks the stone. And then Ein thinks in shock that the stone tastes like candy. Olivia asks Ein what happened. He tells his mother that it's nothing like that. Ein asks if he can buy this stone. Ein feels guilty for licking the stone. The man is shocked to think that Ein liked the stone. The man tells Ein that he will then give him the stone as a gift. In gratitude for their patronage, Olivia says thank God and that she will take these three kinds. Olivia tells Ein that they should go for a walk. He happily tells his mother yes. Ein looks at the stone in his hands. The yellow magic stone became colorless. The next day Ein practices with the sword again. He breathes heavily as he stands on the training field. For some reason he feels energized today. The knight watches Ein's training and says that the young master has again decided to try to attack the armor. He might twist his wrists. Ein attacks the armor again and immediately everything is swallowed up by a cloud of dust. Ein breathes heavily and immediately shouts that it's great, this time he wasn't thrown back. Ein looks at his weapon and realizes that his wooden sword is broken. Ein looks at the armor cut in half. The knight also notices this and opens his mouth in shock. He calls out to the young master in a trembling voice. He shouts that Ein cut the iron armor with a wooden sword. Can he buy this stone? Horse-drawn carts are driving along the street. Olivia sits in one of them and sulks. Ein asks mom to please don't be so angry. Olivia tells Ein that she can't live with it. Of course, there is a reason why Ein's mother was angry. Today there will be a meeting of nobles where they will represent their children. And his father Logan is going to announce to everyone that the future head of the Reinhardt house will be his second son Grint. Logan will also announce Grint's engagement to the Marquis daughter Shannon Bluesnow. Ein believes that it is too early to announce the engagement now, when Grint is only four years old. Olivia tells Ein that she is sorry that his father cares more about Grint than him. He has to go through all this. Ein tells his mom not to worry, saying that everything is fine. Ein thinks to himself that, to be honest, he is a little offended, but most of all. Ein is upset seeing his mother so sad and lonely. Ein thinks that he should try even harder for his father's recognition. And in the end, he never understood what happened that day when Ein cut the metal armor with a wooden sword. Everyone began to say that the armor was simply worn out. Ein thinks that this happened after he licked the stone. Olivia tells Ein that they have arrived. Ein and Olivia get out of the carriage. They find themselves in front of the entrance to a luxurious palace. They admire what a magnificent estate is in front of them. Olivia says foo foo foo, after all this is the estate of the only Archduke of the Kingdom of Heim. Loga calls Olivia and Ina. He tells them that he, Camille and Grint will go greet Grint's fiancé and her family. Olivia and Ein can wait in the hall. Ein notices Camille and Grint looking at them and smiling. Olivia turns away from her ex-husband and tells him okay, they'll do it. She tells Ein to follow her. Camille tells Logan that the Marquis of Blauenot has been waiting for them. He tells her that they should go then. Olivia asks about Ein not being allowed to attend the meeting and what that means. The servant tells Olivia that he is very sorry. There must have been some error in compiling the list. Each family is only allowed to bring one child and the Reinhardt family is already there with Mr. Grint. Olivia tells the servant that it is not their fault and asks him if he could let Ein in. The servant tells Olivia that they cannot do this. Ein thinks that it is most likely Aunt Camilla's fault. She did this so that he would not interfere with Grint. Ein looks at his mother and thinks that not only are they in trouble because of this, but so is the butler. The servant continues to tell Olivia that he is very sorry. Ein thinks that, to be honest, he was not very interested in this meeting. Ein tells Olivia how beautiful the garden is down there. It would be great if they could walk around in it. The servant bows his head, 
thanking him for the offer and adding that he will report this to the master. Olivia asks Ayn, are you sure he's not upset about everything that happened? Ayn tells her mom that the Archduke's garden is amazing. Ayn tells his mother that there are many beautiful flowers there, shining just like her. Therefore, instead of meeting, Ayn will be happier if they admire these beautiful flowers together. Olivia is confused and shocked by her son's words. She hugs Ayn and tells him that if they were at home, she would have hugged him even tighter. Olivia hugs Ayn. And he, smiling, tells her that she hugged him tightly enough. The servant runs to Olivia and Ayn, telling him that the Archduke has given his permission to visit the garden. Olivia says thank you very much to the servant. The servant continues, saying that nevertheless the Archduke ordered someone to accompany them. They don't understand what someone means. A girl comes up to them and says that she is pleased to meet you. She asks Ayn that he is the eldest son of House Reinhardt. The girl introduces herself, saying her name is Klein. She is the granddaughter of the head of the house of Augustus Count Augustus. Ein introduces himself, saying his name is Ein Reinhardt. He asks Klein for forgiveness and asks her what the Archduke's granddaughter is doing here. Klein is silent and does not know how to respond to this. Here Klein clears his throat and apologizes for the mistake at home August. Klein tells Mr. Ein and Miss Olivia that she will be their chaperone today and she hopes they all have a good time. Later, Klein, Olivia and Ayn are walking in the garden. Olivia tells Klein that she thinks Ayn is happy because she agreed to accompany him. Klein tells Olivia that she is glad to hear such words. She is also grateful that she was able to interact with Mistress Olivia. Ayn looks at the flowers and says that the flowers glow. How beautiful it is. Ayn turns and says that from a distance the garden looked beautiful, but everything in it turned out to be even more beautiful. Klein tells Ayn that the garden is simply mesmerizing at this time of day. Have they heard the news about the Reinhard house? The second son will become the next head of the house. The one with the holy knight skill. This is just a gift from heaven, considering what a terrible eldest son they have, who knows no manners. Apparently in the near future, the kingdom of Heim will prosper with such an heir to the great General Logan. Klein looks at Olivia and Ayn and says that it is better not to believe rumors. Among the nobles, he is the most like a gentleman. Then Ayn comes up to Klein and tells her that she is so beautiful. She doesn't understand what he's talking about, but Ayn corrects herself, saying that this rose is so beautiful. Klein says they are red and blue roses, a type of flower that can bloom at any time. They are known for being very difficult to grow, requiring a perfect balance of water, light, and soil. Ayn answers her clearly. Klein tells Ayn to be very careful with them. The thorns of these roses contain deadly poison. They say one drop can kill 1,000 people. The poison causes unbearable pain and heat, which is why they are sometimes called fiery blue roses. Ayn says that the names of the flowers have a certain meaning. Olivia also leans towards the flowers and says that these flowers can be a wonderful decoration. Ayn asks mom what she wants to say, that these flowers are used as interior decoration. Olivia replies that she was talking about real jewelry. Klein says that the poison of these flowers is also capable of crystallizing. She had heard that if the poison was removed from them, they would become a work of art in themselves, and they will be called star crystals. They say that such crystals look like the starry sky. These flowers are also considered the best decoration in the world. Klein continues by saying that these flowers are very expensive. There are only two of these in their kingdom. Ein asks about yes, even if there are so many of them growing. Klein says that the process of removing poison is very complex, and the method itself is expensive. Olivia says she thinks the cost would be equal to half of their territory's annual taxes. Ayn screams so much in shock. Ayn remembers the goddess's words that he has the skill of decomposing toxins. It is strong against poisons and can destroy bacteria. Ayn thinks about the poison, and what if only there was no side effect. Ayn remembers Logan holding Grint in his arms and Camille laughing. Ayn thinks that it will be enough if he doesn't faint. Ayn asks Lady Klein if she would like to see this decoration. Klein tells him that of course, this is her dream. 
Ein thinks that it will be enough if he doesn't faint. He may have been destined to be used, but he wants to believe that even someone like him is capable of something. Ein says that he understands and then touches the flower. Olivia and Klein yell at Ein not to touch the flower. Ein pricks his hand with a flower. Ein thinks about how it feels like he's drinking soda. It's so refreshing. Using the decomposition of toxins feels so good. But why does an Ein feel the recoil like last time? If that's the case then. Klein yells at Ein to throw away the flower. Olivia looks at her son in surprise. Ein thinks that he can do this. Ein realizes with a smile that everything is just as the goddess said. His skill is strong against poisons. When the smoke clears Klein says, no, this cannot be. Ein holds a star crystal in his hands instead of a flower. Ein looks at Olivia and Klein with a smile. Ein apologizes to the girls for scaring them, saying that he was just using his skill. Klein, shocked, asks about the skill. She tells Ein that even if he has the skill, he shouldn't be so careless. She had never heard of a person who could take a red and blue rose. Ein falls to one knee in front of her and presents her with a flower. He tells Lady Klein that he has fulfilled her dream, and he asks her if she will accept this gift from him. Olivia covers her mouth in admiration and looks at her son. Ein sits on one knee holding out a rose to Klein. Ein thinks to himself about how cliché this is. He was too into the atmosphere to say something so banal. Ein opens one eye slightly, wondering if Klein will make fun of him. She looks at Ein in shock. She asks Ayn that he will really just give her the flower. Ayn answers her with a smile of course, he will be offended if she does not accept the gift. Klein hesitates. Here Klein stretches out his hands to Ayn and says that he will gladly accept his gift. Ayn asks Lady Clan if she would mind if he takes another one for his mother. Klein tells him that of course he can take the flower, and then Ayn very quickly transforms the new flower and then gives it to his mother. Klein, watching him, thinks that he did it so easily. A little later at the castle, Klein says that she is very sorry, she would like to chat more with Ein and Olivia, but she has to go. Olivia tells her not to worry, saying that thanks to Klein they were able to have a great time tonight. Ein says thank you very much to Lady Klein for today's. But he doesn't have time to finish, as someone is loudly calling Klein. She immediately points her finger at Ein and tells him that he doesn't need to be so formal. If he continues, he might not talk to her. She asks Ein if he understood her. Ein tells Klein with a smile that he understands everything. Ein notices families emerging from the main hall. Ein asks mom that their dad is late because everyone is already leaving. Olivia turns to the servant, asking if he knows where her husband, Count Reinhardt, is. The servant girl replies that Count Reinhardt said he had to go to a slumber party. That's why he left early. Olivia is shocked that Logan didn't even warn them. Ein says under his breath that he is really so useless in his father's eyes. Olivia hears this and looks at her son. She kneels down in front of Ein and asks him if he likes his father. Ein tells his mother that he is grateful to his father for raising him. But he cannot forgive because he treats Olivia so badly. Ein thinks to himself that, to be honest, he can't say that he likes his father. Olivia tells her son that then she is glad to hear it from him. Ein doesn't understand his mother's reaction. Olivia tells him that she can't watch him suffer anymore. She takes her son's hand and says it's time for them to go. Ein asks that he is ready to go, but where? Olivia tells Ein that they are going to the most beautiful place on earth, to their home kingdom. Ein asks Olivia which home kingdom she is talking about. Olivia takes the ring off her finger and says that Ein got it right. Ein asks why mom took off the ring. Olivia tells him that she doesn't need it anymore. Olivia taps her earring and talks about how she's coming home and asking someone to please take her away from here. Olivia tells Ein that they should return to the port city. He tells her okay. Ein and Olivia take a carriage home. Ein tells his mom that it's good that they got back to the estate before midnight. But their carriage passes the gate to the estate. Ein asks his mother why they didn't stop. Olivia asks Ein to just wait a little longer. He answers mom okay with a smile. Ein looks out the window of the cart and asks what it is. Why is the city still so noisy? 
People scream in shock about what this thing is. They ask someone to stop this and ask where these knights are. Ein looks in shock at the same place where all the people are. This is a huge warship equipped with battle cannons. Ein shouts that there is a ship in the port. It is so huge, maybe even more than 200 meters long. Olivia tells Ein that they have to go. He follows his mother, not understanding what is happening. People immediately surround Olivia and Ein. They don't understand what kind of ship is in front of them. Here knights descend from the ship onto the pier. People scream in shock that they are already here. We need to save our lives. The soldiers approach Olivia and line up in front of her in battle formation. Ein stands in front of his mother in an attempt to protect her. But Olivia leans over to Ein and tells him it's okay. Someone comes out from the crowd of knights and tells the little knight to be calm. The girl takes off her helmet and tells Mr. Pelmine that she is pleased to meet you. Her name is Christina Wernstein. Ein thinks that they are not enemies. Christina is incredibly beautiful. Olivia tells Christina that they haven't seen each other for a long time. Christina tells Olivia that it is mutual. She is glad to see Mistress Olivia again. She rushed to her immediately after her message. Their mission is to bring Princess Olivia back home. Ein is shocked and does not understand what is happening. He wonders if his mother is a princess. He asks his mother to tell him what is happening. Olivia tells Ein that she will tell him everything while they are sailing. She calls her son with her, saying that now it's time for them to board the ship. A little later at the estate of Archduke Augustus, the head of the August family, Count August, says that he understood everything. So the five-year-old took care of the mistake their family made. It seems that the eldest son of the Reinhardt family has an extraordinary personality. Klein says yeah, she totally agrees with her grandfather. She shows her grandfather her crystal flower and asks him to see what beauty Ein gave her. Count August puts his hand to his head and asks why then the Reinhardt family wants to make their second son the next head. Just don't let them tell him that they want to break their promise. Klein asks about the promise. Count August asks Klein to keep what he says a secret. She tells her grandfather that she understands. Count Augustus says that the port city of Reinhardt. If you take a ship and go on a two-day trip from there, you might stumble upon the continent. Klein must know what kingdom is there. She tells her grandfather that of course. The continent of Ishtar is located there, and the only kingdom on it is the United Nation Ishtalik. This is a great kingdom to which they are inferior in science, technology and military power, but what does that have to do with it? Count Augustus says that Mrs. Th Olivia is not just the heiress of a trading company. Klein is shocked by his words. Count August says that Mrs. Th Olivia is a representative of Ishtaliki. But she is not a simple representative, but the daughter of Silverd von Ishtalik himself, the current king of Ishtaliki. She is the second princess of Olivia Fo Ixtalik. This is Mistress Olivia's true identity. Klein in shock talks about what Ein means. He calls his mother in shock. She looks back at him and smiles. Ein of royal blood. On the ship, Olivia asks Ein for forgiveness for keeping all this a secret. Ein asks her mother why the princess of such a great state married the head of the Renhardt family. Olivia begins to say that the whole point is that but she doesn't have time to finish, as someone is calling her. It turns out to be Christina. Ein tells his mom that this Christina scares him. She says that she just does what she has to do. Olivia asks Ein for forgiveness, saying that she can't tell him that now. Ein answers his mother with a smile that it's okay, he understands everything. Ein thinks that this is the first time he has seen his mother so cheerful. It's much better than seeing her sad face every day. Christina asks Mistress Olivia about receiving this star crystal from the Reinhardt family. Olivia says no way, Ein gave it to her, and she asks Christina if the crystal is really beautiful. Christina tells Olivia that of course she believes her, which is why she treats him so carefully. Yes, and offering a star crystal as gifts to the opposite sex means that a person is making an offer. Ein is shocked. He remembers how Klein told him that she would gladly accept the crystal from him. Ein talks about that's why Klein reacted to his proposal the way she did then. What should he do? He didn't mean anything like that, although if it was Klein, but what was he thinking about? 
Olivia looks at her son and thinks he's super cute. Olivia asks Christina when they will arrive in the capital. Christina replies that upon arrival at the port, they will transfer to the water train, so they will be in the capital at approximately 11 a.m. Ayn asks in surprise about the train and immediately asks about the fact that there are trains in Ishtalik. Christina tells him yes, it's called the water train, it moves thanks to the heating of water produced by water magic stones. Ayn answers clearly, adding that this is how the train works thanks to the steam generated. Ein thinks about what, just think, a steam engine. Compared to the Kingdom of Heim, the development is on a completely different level. Christina tells Ein that his knowledge is amazing. He even knows how a steam engine works. Apparently, he is a great student. Ein says that he just read it in a book. Olivia tells Christina that she can see how smart and a good boy Ein is. Ein thinks that it was close. He almost revealed the knowledge that remained with him after his rebirth. Christina says that there is still a little time before arriving in Ishtalik. Therefore, Olivia and Ayn should take a good rest. The ship sails and Olivia sleeps with Ayn. Then they dine on gourmet dishes. Eventually Ayn gets dressed up. And they change trains. Ayn looks around him in shock, his mouth open. Ayn tells his mother that there are so many interesting things in Ishtalik. Not just science and technology. This is the first time he has seen so many demihumans. Olivia tells Ayn that Ishtalika is a multicultural country, so both people and other races exist here. Christina announces to them that they have arrived. Christina announces her return to the castle. Ayn tells his mom that Christina looks so cool. Olivia tells her son that Christina may act formal, but she is still a little awkward. Christina asks Olivia and Ayn to be careful, but she slips and almost falls. Olivia laughs, and Ayn thinks that he still won't be able to forget it. Olivia asks Christina what she told her father about her return. Christina replies that in fact due to the urgency of the message, she did not have time to inform Olivia's father about it. However, Mrs. Mark told everyone to behave as usual when meeting her. Olivia says what's expected from the brand. She made sure that her father did not get distracted from work. Christina adds that Mark also said that if they make noise, they will disturb his majesty. Olivia says Mark is probably mad at her. Ein asks his mom about the brand she's talking about. Olivia replies that she is the maid who took care of her when she was little. Mark may seem scary, but she is a good person. Olivia will introduce Ein to her later. The same one imagines her as a terrible woman. Christina leads Olivia and Ayn to the hall and says that His Majesty is in the meeting room. Olivia asks Christina about her father being busy right now. Ayn says it would be bad if they interfered in the middle of the meeting. Christina says that they can greet His Majesty later. Olivia replies that they should come in then. Ayn calls out to her mom in shock, just as Christina tries to stop Olivia, who opens the door and shouts to her dad that she's back. Her father is holding a meeting at the table at this time. Ayn looks at his grandfather in shock, and he understands that the man in front of him is the king of Ishtaliki. He was honored with a meeting with the king of the great kingdom. Olivia and Ayn stand before the king of Ishtaliki. Ayn looks at the man admiringly and thinks that the aura around the king is so annoying. So this is the king of the great country of Ishtaliki. Ayn swallows. The king gets up and approaches Olivia and asks her what is happening. Why is Olivia here if she got married on another continent? And this child? Ein tries to clear his throat. He thinks that he is very nervous. His voice. But then mom puts her hand on Ein's shoulder, encouraging him. Ein gains confidence and tells the king of Ishtaliki that he is glad to meet him. Ein introduces himself, saying that he used to be part of the Reinhardt family. The king of Ishtaliki says that it turns out that Ayn is the son of Olivia. The man sits down on one knee in front of Ayn and tells him that he is the king of Ishtalik Silvered von Ishtalik. And he is Ayn's grandfather. The man smiles at Ayn. Then a man approaches them and tells Mr. B. Ayn that he and his majesty were looking forward to meeting him. The man introduces himself, saying his name is Lloyd Galatia. He is the Grand Marshal of Istariki. He is always ready to give his life for Ayn. 
Lloyd Galatia shakes Ayn's hand and then tells the man that he is pleased to meet him. Silvered von Ishtalika tells Ayn that he understands everything, but there is something else that worries him. Ayn said he used to be part of the Reinhardt family. The king immediately laughs, saying that okay, apparently his hearing is not what it used to be. But then Olivia interrupts her father and tells him that she has divorced her husband. She doesn't want to go back there anymore. Silvered von Ishtalika asks Lloyd Galatia if he can slap him in the face in this case. He asks his majesty for forgiveness and tells him that he heard everything correctly. Silvered von Ishtalika asks his daughter why she did this. Olivia replies that she doesn't think Ayn was happy staying there, which is why she did what she did. Lloyd Galatia and Silvered von Ishtalika look at her in shock at her words. The king says he thinks they should adjourn the meeting. Everyone present is forbidden to talk about what happened here. All his subjects answer that they understood his majesty's order. Immediately the king calls Christina, who readily answers her master. Silvered von Ishtalika asks Christina to call Warren and Katama, they all need to discuss this. Silvered von Ishtalika tells Lloyd to start gathering troops. He answers the king that he understood him. Ein doesn't understand what's wrong with this man's aura. Olivia tells her father not to worry about it. And they cannot attack her previous country because of the promise of the first king of Ishtaliki. A little later, the first princess Kadima von Ishtalika says that just think, they abandoned him only because of the skill with which he was born, what antediluvian thinking. Olivia asks Kadima that her older sister feels the same way. Kadima says yes, but he still won't listen to her. Ein thinks about that the first princess of Ishtaliki was a giant cat. Olivia asks her father that now she can explain everything to Ein. The king tells her that yes, she can do it now. After all, they kept their promise. Prime Minister of Ishtalki Warren Lark asks his majesty for permission to explain everything to Ein. Warren Lark tells Ein that the main reason Olivia got married there is because Haim has the sea crystal that Ishtalika needs. Ein asks about the crystal being some kind of mineral residue. Warren Lark responds that it could be said that way. These are crystals made from the bones of monsters that live in the sea. In Ishtalik they use them to create magical items. Ein says that he only saw a few magical items in Haim. Warren Lark replies that he thinks they were ordinary magic items. He continues by saying that other countries do not use sea crystals. They create objects from magical stones that can harm the user with their power. But in Ishtalik they use a special method of using sea crystals to control this power. With this they can allow everyone in Ishtalik to use magic items. However, all the crystals around Ishtaliki have already been mined and finding them has become more and more difficult. Therefore, finding no other way out, they began to request magic crystals from other countries. Ein answers clearly. Ein asks what it means that his mother married for the sake of the people of Ishtalik. She replies that it was her duty. Warren Lark continues, saying that in exchange for the magic stones they must provide protection. And Mr. Ein will become the Count of the Kingdom of Haim in the future. The King of Ishtaliki says that he thought this was the best solution. Especially when the Sea Dragon is all ready. He wanted to get his daughter and grandson out of his way. Ein doesn't understand who the Sea Dragon is. Lloyd Galatia tells His Majesty what he thinks that it was time for them to start searching for a new magic crystal. Olivia tells her subject that this is not necessary. She continues by saying that she has already inquired about possible suppliers. Even if she does as she wants, this does not mean that she has forgotten her responsibilities as a princess. Olivia asks Ayn if he remembers her work. She tells everyone that she has been collaborating with the mage and adventurer guilds to find suppliers and in the end she found one. Everything can be considered in more detail in the report she compiled. Warren Lark looks at Olivia's report and says she means north of the Jura Temple. But they should have already checked everything there. And here Warren Lark opens his eyes in shock and says that sea crystals from the depths of the sea have begun to appear in the shallow waters. This can't be true. He tells the king that it seems Olivia was conducting her search while hiding her identity through the magician's association. The results are simply amazing. Olivia's research is something special. 
Kadima says with a smile that this was expected from her sister. The king of Ishtaliki says that he simply has no words, Ein looks at his mother in shock Ein thinks that only he, of all those present, knows and understands how much time and effort his mother spent on this Olivia played the role of the count's wife perfectly all this time. The residents respected her and even called her a saint. But after Grint was born, everyone forgot about her. But she still continued to smile. And despite how busy she was, she spent a lot of time with Ein Ein thinks that he can't even thank his mother. The king says that just think, she could do all this herself. He asks his daughter for forgiveness. Olivia puts her hand on Ein's shoulder and tells him that everything is fine. She tells her father Thatin is the most important thing she has. It doesn't matter how hard it is. If something needs to be done for Ein's sake, she will do whatever it takes. Olivia hugs her son and says she's really glad she has Ein. He calls his mother with a smile. Christina says that Mistress Olivia has become not only prettier, but also stronger. Lloyd Galatia supports her, saying that it is true. The King of Ishtaliki says that now they need to take a break to reward Olivia for her hard work. He calls Warren Lark, who says the decree is here. He also managed to obtain the Queen's consent Silvered von Ishtalika says Warren Lark is as fast as ever. And he tells the King that then everything is ready, all he has to do is sign. Kadima puts his seal on the decree. Then Silvered von Ishtalika signs the decree. And then Olivia does it. Warren Lark and Mr. Lloyd confirm the legality of this decree. Ein doesn't understand what's happening. They call his majesty. Ah Ein am sure. Silvered von Ishtalika says that with his name he declares recognition of Ein as a member of the royal family. Ein hearing this thinks that if you tell this story to other people, they will think it is a joke. Ein was born into the family of an earl of a much smaller kingdom than this. No matter how hard he trained, no one recognized him. He was even removed from his place as heir. And now he is Ein von Ishtalika Silvered von Ishtalika tells Ein that he is appointing him crown prince. And so Ein became the heir to the royal family overnight. In the capital of Ishtaliki, there are discussions about what is happening. One girl talks to another about whether she knows the latest news. Looks like Princess Olivia is back. And everyone has already heard about it. But people don't understand what happened in Jame, that Olivia is back. And everyone is talking about the fact that then Olivia's son also returned. And will he become crown prince? Everyone is thinking that this crown prince Ein, what kind of person is he? People can't wait to meet him. Ein trains with Lloyd Galatia and drops his sword and falls to the ground. He says anew that he has excellent sword skills. Grand Marshal of Ishtaliki Lloyd Galatia tells Ein that he seems to have put a lot of effort into his training. Ein thanks the man for the compliment with a smile. But he is still not worthy. Even now, his younger brother can easily defeat him, although he only started training recently. Ein did everything to be recognized by his father and those around him. But in the end he gave up and fled to Ishtalik. How can anyone recognize such a worthless guy like him as the crown prince? Ein wishes he had a better skill. In response, Lloyd Galatia tells Mr. Ein that it looks like his clothes are torn. He asks Ein to stand still Lloyd Galatia takes out the threads and Ein asks him what he wants. And literally in a few seconds Lloyd Galatia sues clothes on Ein's body Ein doesn't understand what kind of magic this is. Lloyd Galatia tells Ein that his skill is called sewing. And doesn't Ein think that such a skill is absolutely unsuitable for a soldier like him? Ein looks at the marshal in shock. Lloyd Galatia says that it is quite embarrassing to have such a skill. But thanks to his efforts, he was able to become a great marshal. So no matter how strong his innate skill is, without his efforts he would not have achieved anything. Lloyd Galatia places his hand on Ein's shoulder and calls out to his master. He tells him that with enough effort, Ein can become anything he wants. And if Ein continues to work on himself, he will soon realize that all this was not in vain. Then he runs up to Ein from behind Kadima and tells him that she found him. She takes Ein away with her, but he does not understand what is happening. Later, Ein asks Kadima why she needed him. Kadima winks at Ein and says that Olivia asked her to check on him. She asks him if he is ready. 
Ayn replies that this is an excellent explanation on her part. Christina approaches them and says they get along so well. She brings Mrs. Ray and Kadima her tea. Ayn says with a smile that Kadima is easy to get along with. Well, she's a cat Kadima asks Ina to show her status first. Kadima looks at Ayn's panel and says that even with such a status, Ayn was still not chosen as the heir of the family. He doesn't understand what she's talking about. Ayn shouts in shock that his status has improved Ayn asks what kind of absorption skill this is. Kadima replies that it is not surprising that he has such a skill. Kadima tells Ayn that this proves that he is Olivia's son. This is the racial skill of dryads. Ayn doesn't understand what Kadima is talking about. And then he shouts about what it all means. Are dryads this not tree spirits? Ayn shouts in shock that he is one of them. Kadima tells him that he didn't know about it. She thinks Ayn might try to turn into a plant like Olivia. Ayn shouts that this is the first time he has heard about this. Representatives of different races can be found in the royal family tree. The king of Ishtaliki is a human, Kadima is a cat, and Olivia is a dryad. Kadima says that very often children are born with the genes of their ancient ancestors. Therefore, until the child is born, no one can be sure what race the child will be. Ayn thinks that there is a very strange bloodline in the royal family. Kadima tells Ayn that he says his status has risen a lot lately. He answers yes. He trained hard all this time, but this does not explain such a sharp jump Kadima winks at him and says that everything is clear. She thinks that because of this, Ayn absorbed the energy of the magic stones. Ayn asks Kadima why she thinks this way. Kadma replies that monsters increase their strength by eating each other's magic stones, but people cannot use this method because it harms their bodies. Kadima continues, telling Ayn that with the decomposition of the toxins, this may become possible. Of course, this is just her guess. Kadima asks Ayn if he has any thoughts on on this occasion. Ayn replies that he first saw magic stones when he went shopping with his mother, and the stone seemed so appetizing to him that Ayn accidentally licked it. But it was just a small pebble. He doesn't think the stone could have affected him that much. And after that, Ayn did not encounter stones. Christina tells Ayn no. It seems to her that Mr. P Ayn absorbed the energy of the magic stone inside her. Ayn immediately tells her no, he didn't do anything like that. And where does the magic stone come from in Christina's body? Christina tells Ayn that she is actually an elf, and every half-human has a magic stone in his body. Ayn tells her that if every half-human has a magic stone, then it means there is one inside him too. Christina says knew that she felt this when they were heading to the capital. Later she realized that she was very tired and almost lost consciousness. Ayn says that she almost fell then because she felt bad, and not because of her clumsiness. Christina shouts to Ayn that she is not clumsy. Ayn immediately says stop. But then what about her magic stone? He asks Christina if she was badly hurt. She replies that she is fine. She just needs to rest a little. Ayn tells her thank God. Kadima says that now they should test his theory. She says they should try starting with two boxes of magic stones. First Christina says that she doesn't ease this too much. Kadima says that the first box contains cheap stones worth 5,000 gold, and in the second there are expensive stones worth 90,000 gold. Ayn decides that they should start with the cheap ones then. Later, Ayn throws the last stone into the box and asks Kadima if everything is okay. She says yes, Ayn dealt with the stones very quickly. Christina says that the stones have lost their color. Kadima pushes another box towards Ayn and tells him to try these now. Ayn thinks that he wonders what these stones taste like. But then Ayn bends over and groans in pain Christina calls Mr. Ayn. Kalama asks him what is wrong and if he is okay. Ayn replies that the stone tastes like walnuts and he doesn't like them. Kadama asks how a dryad can not like nuts. She says that it seems that Mr. Dupain Ayn cannot randomly absorb energy from magic stones Ayn asks about what plan. Kadama asks Ayn to let her explain. She says Ayn needs to understand two things. The better the stone, the more it will increase his status. But each type of stone has a limited amount of energy, which she can absorb to improve her status. Ayn tells Kadima that it turns out that everything is not as simple as he thought.
Kadima tells him that it is nothing. He's already absorbed enough Ayn says yes, and it looks like he got a new skill. Kadimer replies that he thinks it is because he absorbed energy from a high-level monster stone. Christina tells Mr. Ayn that he is sure that he is feeling well. Ayn replies that everything is fine. But when he first used the decomposition of toxins, he was tormented by a severe headache. Why is everything okay with him now? Katama tells Ayn that it is all thanks to his gift of learning skill. It strengthens Ayn's body and improves his immunity. Then, from behind the door, someone asks the sister for permission to enter Katama answers him of course. Olivia comes in and Ayn calls for his mom. Olivia hugs Ayn and talks about how long it's been since she's seen him. Katama tells Olivia that she hasn't found any problems. Olivia says, which is great. Olivia tells Ayn to come with her. They walk along the corridor and come to the king of Ishtaliki. Olivia asks her father for forgiveness for keeping them waiting. The king tells Olivia and Ayn to follow him. They come to a huge gate Ayn asks his grandfather what it is. He tells him that this is the royal treasury. They go inside and Ayn, looking around, asks Silverd von Ishtalika, why did the three of them come here? The king tells Ayn that as a reward for the latter's accomplishments, Olivia asked him to give him something. Ayn is shocked and doesn't understand what this means. Silverd von Ishtalik says that he will give Ayn the national treasure of Ishtalik Magikaldalahan stone. Silverd von Ishtalika says that more than 500 years ago, a demon king appeared on the continent, and the Dullahan was one of his henchmen. With his sword he could separate heaven and earth. He was a strong warrior, dressed in black, who fell into the annals of history. Ayn asks his grandfather that such a stone is for him. Olivia tells her son that their ancestor, the first king, defeated all the demons and founded the kingdom. He was recognized by everyone as a hero of the world. Ayn understands what is this feeling. Even if it sounds like a simple fairy tale, he still can't contain his excitement. Silverd von Ishtalika asks Olivia that maybe she will change her mind. This is still a national treasure. She replies that maybe this treasure is called national, but in fact it is their family's treasure. Ein goes to the pedestal with the crystal. Olivia asks her father to stop and tells him not to come any closer. Magical energy can harm him. Her father tells her that she should also leave. Ein goes to the crystal and neutralizes the poisonous aura around it. Silverd von Ishtalika says that the poison disappears around Ein, so this is how much strength his grandson has. Ein looks at the crystal and thinks that it is different from the other stones. He feels great power in the stone Ein places his hand on the magic crystal, and then Ein hears a voice that tells him that he has finally returned. Ein is shocked and does not understand what is happening. The king asks Olivia not to come close to his son. Ein doesn't understand what's happening to him. Even without absorption, the energy itself flows into it. The king shouts to Ein that if he cannot contain the power of the crystal, then he should stop. Ein stands holding the crystal, and magic swirls around him. And then the entire space around is filled with bright light. Later, Olivia and her father wonder if it's all over. When the fog clears, Ein stands in it. He looks at his hands in shock and says that he is full of strength. At this time, in the estate of Archduke Augustus in the kingdom of Heim Klein stands and looks at the sky. She wonders about, when will she meet Ein again? She misses him. Klein walks around the room, holding the crystal given to her by Ein. She talks about it sadly that Ein disappeared immediately after presenting such a lovely gift. It's not fair to do that. Then someone asks Lady Klein for permission to enter. She asks the maid what happened. She tells Klein that the master asked her to check how her work is progressing. Klein tells the woman that she has already done everything. All the papers are on the cabinet, she can take them to her father. The girl is shocked and says that she heard that it should take at least one week. Klein smiles and says that that she simply concentrated on work and managed to get everything done in two days. She asks the girl to tell her father to give him a more difficult task next time. The girl in shock picks up a huge stack of papers and says that Klein did all this in two days. Okay, she will tell her father her request. Klein thinks that this is still not enough, but she must improve. 
The next time she meets Ayn, she should be able to support him in his difficult time. The girl tells Klein that she received a letter from her owner. Klein leans back on the pillow and says that a letter has arrived from his grandfather. What is it this time? Horse racing? Dancing? Let the girl just add it to her schedule. The girl tells Klein the words of her grandfather, prepare a letter for him. Klein immediately shouts to the maid that why did she only say this now? This is much more important than some kind of work. She talks about where her paper and pen are, stop. Plain paper won't do for her. She needs the best quality paper for writing. Klein squeezes the paper, thinking about what she should write to Ein. She had never written a letter to a man. The maid laughs at Klein's behavior. She asks the girl not to laugh, saying that she is absolutely serious now. The girl asks Klein for forgiveness, saying that this is the first time she has seen her so confused. Maybe she should first consult with the owner. Klein leaves saying that this is great advice. She will do so. Klein runs away, shouting to the girl thanks for the advice. The maid asks her not to rush so much, saying that the owner will not run away anywhere. Klein runs down the corridor and thinks about Ina. If only he knew how much he needed to discuss with him. She wonders what he is doing right now. Ein stands with his grandfather and mother. Silvered von Ischtelikus says that this is a complete success. Olivia only has to look at Ein's status. He simply took off after absorbing the stone's power. Olivia admiringly tells Ein that he has become even more amazing. The king tells Ein not to let the numbers go to his head, however. Ein must remember that he should train hard so that his body can withstand all this force. Ein tells the king that he understood him. The king asks Olivia that everything went according to her plan. Ein doesn't understand what he's talking about. Silvered von Ischtelika tells Olivia that she, as the closest person to Owen, the man definitely knew about his son's ability. And why did Olivia hide it? The king thinks Olivia planned all this from the beginning. Ein calls his mother in shock. Olivia looks at her son and smiles. She says that at first she thought only about fulfilling her duty as a member of the royal family. However, after the death of their closest ally the former head of the Reinhardt family, she began to feel insecure about their future, and as a result. Olivia says that she could not decide to speed up with Logan. The king looks at her in shock. Olivia confirms his suspicions, saying that she gave birth to Ein as a dryad. Her father was right that she was planning Guvala, it's all from the very beginning. She asks her father for forgiveness. Ein begins to suspect what this all means. Silvered von Ischtelika tells Ein that he needs to discuss something with Olivia. Ein can leave the treasury first. He says okay and leaves. Later, Kadima and Warren drink tea while sitting at the table Kadima puts the cup of tea on the table and speaks clearly. She continues, saying that she thought about this even when she read about the first dryad in their royal family. Warren tells Kadima that perhaps sending Olivia to Heim was a mistake on their part. Ein says that's pretty much how it happened. But first he wants to find out what it is rooting such. Kadima says that this is the usual way of conceiving children. Warren says Kadima could have said it a little differently Ein replies, conception and conception, what's wrong with that? Kadima says that however, unlike other races, for dryads, conception is a more serious matter. Ein asks about that, which means more serious. Kadima says that throughout their lives, dryads can have only one partner with whom they must share their life energy. And this is called rooting. Ein asks Warren if this is true. He answers him yeah. Ein says that then he will believe him. Kadima, hearing this, shouts that Ein definitely had to ask him again. Ein says didn't his mom say that she did not dare to do this. What about him then? Kadima replies that this is where one of the characteristics of dryads comes into play. They all have one amazing ability. Only once in their life can they give birth to a child without a partner. Kadima says hey well, to put it simply, that son of Olivia alone. Ein has no father. He was born from Olivia's branch. Warren says that when the time came, she hesitated. But as a member of the royal family, she was bound to have offspring. He is sure that this decision was difficult for Olivia Kadima says that in addition, dryads have the skill of hypnosis, so it was not difficult for Olivia to fool her hubby around her finger. He most likely didn't notice anything. 
Kadima says that despite this, Wonverthing hit Olivia so hard, so she hopes that he can forgive her. Ayn replies that of course. Ayn says that he is even glad that his mother did not settle down with his father. Ayn corrects himself, saying Logan instead of his father. The main thing is that his mother's life is not in danger. And according to those around him, he doesn't care about it. Cadmus says that although this method is not often used, she is sure that Olivia went through a lot for him. Warren says that, in addition, the Reinhardt family did not fulfill their part of the agreement to become the next head of the family. Aheim remains silent, and he doesn't think anyone would blame Olivia. Ein smiles and says he's glad to hear that. Well, now he wouldn't mind eating something. Kadima tells Ayn that his nerves are stronger than they seem at first glance. Kadima tells Ayn that she advises him not to go into the reception room. He doesn't understand why he can't do this. Warren replies that there is another one of the national treasure, Demon King's Magic Stone, there as decoration. Ayn shouts that this is the stone of the same Demon King, who was defeated by the first king. Warren tells him that yes, the same one. Kadima tells Ayn that there is a theory that when he is hungry, he can accidentally absorb the magical energy of the stones near him, like that time with Christina. That's why Ayn can't even go near there, it's completely impossible. Ayn continues talking about the first king, that according to his mother, he was so strong that he was known as a hero. Warren tells him of course, but everyone in their country loved him not only for his strength, but also for a big heart. He was a truly strong man. Ein clenches his fists saying the words, truly strong. Ein says that this means that someone as strong as the first king will be known in other kingdoms, such as Heim. Warren answers him of course. He asks Ein to forget about Jaime, such a hero will be known throughout the world. Ein says he's been thinking about this for a long time. Mom sacrificed herself so many times for him but he had not yet justified even a fraction of her efforts. Ayn continues, saying that maybe it's all because he became the crown prince. Or because his status skyrocketed because of that treasure. He still hasn't fully come back to reality. Ayn shouts about what he wants to show everyone. Ayn wants to show his family and heart that he is worthy. He knows it won't be easy, but even so, he wants to become as great a king as the first king. Ayn leans his hands on the table and says that probably to Kadima and Warren funny hearing this from a child. They are from he tells him that not at all. Warren asks Ayn to let him help him in this matter. He will do everything in his power. Fencing lessons can be left to Chris and Lloyd. He asks Aino how about he teach him the rest. Ayn agrees to this, asking the old man to take care of him. Kadima tells Ayn that she will then be in charge of testing his power and learning it. Kadima drags Ayn along, asking him to show her what he got from that piece of granite. Warren looks at this and says that Mr. Kanine looks so much like him. Days passed, and now summer has come. Ayn had already spent eight months in Ishtalik Lid calls Mr. Tayin and tells him that today in training he will fight forest monsters. Unlike the soldiers in the castle, the monsters will try to kill him. Ayn should be more careful. Christina stands next to Lloyd. Ayn says he's ready. They meet a wood rat. Christina tells Ayn about this monster and tries to tell him what he needs to do to win. But Ayn interrupts her, saying that it will be better if he himself understands how to win. Lloyd says that this will be the master's first fight. Christina shouts to Ayn for him to try. Ayn looks at the monster and thinks that it has sharp claws and fangs. He wouldn't want to experience them himself. He needs to be on alert. The forest rat lunges at Ayn, and he kills the monster with one blow of his sword. He understands that he can handle the forest rat. He decides to continue the fight with other monsters. A little later, Clyde laughs, saying that after Ayn's battle, there were no monsters left in the area. Christina says that the master can fight with several soldiers from the castle, which was expected of him. However, he should not relax. Then a monster appears behind Ayn. Christina wants to intervene, but Lloyd stops her. Ayn looks at the phenomenon which is called the power of Dullahan. Phantom Hand. Ayn tells Christine and Laid that this is the Black Knight's skill that he learned during these eight months. He can set length and strength through the influence of energy. And with the help of this equipment, Kadam, 
Ein says that this allows energy to be absorbed from the stone, even if the creature is still alive. He called it the Black Chain of Doom. Christina says that Ein has created something very dangerous. Ein says that, but the taste is getting much worse. Licking rocks is much more enjoyable. He needs to tell Kadima about this. Li Dei looks at Ein and says he can't wait for his future growth. Christina says that she is already afraid of Ein with his chain later, Ein rides with Christina in a carriage. He is asking from Christina about what kind of store this is. She says that they are passing the famous Magali's store of magic stones. All the stones in the castle were bought here. Ein looks out the window in admiration, and Laid asks Ein that maybe they should go there. Lidi asks Christina to look after Ein. He stands out too much. He warns Ein that he shouldn't lick the magic stones. Christina and Ein enter the store. The seller winks at Ein and says welcome. Ein says that right now he is very exhausted. Therefore, there is a chance that he was again unconsciously absorbed no contains part of Chris Sand's magic stone. She is shocked and screams at Ein to please not do this. Lloyd suggests we finish for today. He tells Olivia herself that he thinks that with the current level of powering Sammy, he'll be fine. She responds by saying that she agrees, but Ein asks mom what they are talking about. Olivia sits down in front of Ein and asks about the fact that he will be seven years old this winter. Therefore, she believes that this will be the best time to start training him. Ein repeats about the preparation, asking his mother if she wants to tell him. Olivia smiles and tells Ein that yes, he will go to the academy. Later, Ein sits at the table and frantically leafs through his textbooks. He remembers Olivia's words about what you see, in the capital there is a royal academy, where his father the king is the head of the board of directors, and since she is in the capital, then they can easily get there by water transport, so that Ein herself will not be in any danger. It's completely safe Ein says academy and grins, study at the academy as a crown prince. Just thinking about it makes Ein nervous. Then, from behind the door, someone asks Ein if he can have a minute. This is Christina, who asks Ein that if he is not busy, how about taking a little walk Ein and Christina come to the sea. Ein spreads his arms to the sides and joyfully says that he had no idea that there was such a beautiful beach behind the castle. Christina tells him that this beach is used as an escape route, so it is closed to the public citizens. Christina says anew that tomorrow he will take the entrance exam. She asks Ein what field of study he plans to choose. Ein replies that he thinks he will choose fencing. Christina tells Ein that she doesn't think this is the best choice, but she is confident that Ein herself will easily win, no matter how Ein defeated the knight. Ein replies that he hopes so too and laughs. Christina supports her, saying that of course because Ein and Lloyd are her pride. Ein says that there is something that is bothering her. Will Chris himself and Lloyd win the title if they come face to face with his father Logas? Christina tells Ein that he asked about it after all. Ein immediately apologizes, asking that he shouldn't have asked such a question. Christina tells him no, it's not that simple. Christina says that she understands everything, and asks Ein for permission to tell him something. Christina says that now she will throw her sword on the ground, and please let Ein not lose sight of her until the sword touches the ground. Ein says good. Christina lets go of her sword with a smile, and before he can touch the ground Ein's eyes fly open. The sword falls to the ground and Christina disappears. Ein is shocked and says that Christina is missing. She puts her hand on his shoulder and tells him that she is still here. Christina stands behind him and Ein turns to her in shock. Not understanding how she did this Christina tells Ein that she moved when the sword touched the ground. She is sure that Logos Dono would also not be able to follow her movements. So she thinks that Ein understands exactly what this must mean. Christina continues, talking about what concerns Lloyd Sama, then he can hit Loga's Don on the head during the battle. Ein tells Christina that he thinks she is right. Ein sits on the ground and says that it is good that he decided to become stronger than the first king. But now he understands that for this, he needs to become stronger than Chris San and Lloyd San Ein will make every effort to achieve this. He says thank you very much to Chris San, which amazes the girl. Ein tells Christina that she pulled him outside to help him relax before the test, right? Christina laughs, saying that Ein is right in his guess. Then, a strong wind blows towards them and removes the ribbon from Christina's hair. Ein looks at the girl with her hair down in shock and embarrassment. Christina says, my ribbon. She asks Ein for forgiveness, saying that she will tie her hair now. But then she notices how Ein herself looks at her and asks about that something is wrong. Ein says no with a smile Chris San is just very cunning. Later, Ein arrives at the train station. He is not alone, but together with Christina. Ein says there are so many people here. Christina tells him that this street is called Academic, so it is always full. 
but there are not only students here, but also their guards and several researchers. Christina says they have arrived. Ein, standing behind her in shock, asks why it's her. This is Kingsland Royal Academy. Ein Seishris said that in this case he will go on alone. Christina answers him of course. She asks Ein to give it his all. Ein goes to the academy and says that the test room must be here somewhere. But then a girl flies into the wall. Ein approaches her and asks how she is. But the girl holds her side and cannot say anything. Here someone is talking about what kind of attitude this is. If she has no motivation, then she should just go home. Ein wonders if the person standing in front of him could be this person. This is the examiner. He tells the girl that it's better for her to go home and ask her mommy to change his diaper. He asks who is next. Another student comes forward and asks the examiner to please take care of him. During the entrance exam, students are not allowed to give their name. This rule was introduced to ensure that the exam is 100% clean. During the exam, students can of course use their sword. The examiner defeats the challenging student and says that that even the weakest monster could easily beat the crap out of him. He shouts to the students that they really believe that they can serve under his majesty with such achievements and asks him to leave. But of course, no one forbids students to use martial arts, and they can also use their skills if they are not ranged attacks. The examiner tells Ein that he is next and realizes that Ein is the last. However, due to the uniqueness of his skill, Ein is not eager to use it. Ein decides that he will show the examiner his strength with his blade Ein pompously takes out his sword. He enters the arena and asks the examiner to please take care of him. He smiles and tells Ein to come closer and try to defeat him. Ein rushes to attack. The examiner is shocked and puts out his sword, defending himself from the attack. He is amazed and tells Ein that he is not bad. They get into a fight. Ein attacks the examiner again and again. He thinks he needs to act faster. Ein must make sure that the examiner cannot predict his next strike. He should take advantage of the speed to come from behind and strike. Ein decides that the time has come to attack and rushes into battle. But then the examiner hits him in the side. Ein flies to the side, and the examiner says that Ein thinks too much of himself. He doesn't have even a shred of the necessary equipment. Ein breathes heavily and thinks about what he knew. This man is stronger than knights. Ein continues his thoughts by saying that all this does not mean that he does not have a chance to win. Besides, it's just an exam, so you don't have to win it. The examiner tells Ein that he really thinks such stupid tricks will work against him. And looking at Ein's insignificant technique, the examiner is sure that his master is just as insignificant. He asks Ein how about leaving it at that. Ein answers no, adding that he wants to continue testing. The man smiles and tells Ein not to even think about holding back because he's an examiner. These are the rules at the academy. The man continues, saying that there is trash like Ein who doesn't even know how to use his powers. I suppose he was brought up in a family of scum. He invites Ein to come up to him and let him teach him a few lessons. Ein begins to seethe with anger. Ein asks that if it is not a magic or ranged skill, then he can use it correctly in battle. That's what it says in the academy rules. The examiner tells him that yes, that is so. He asks Ein what skill he is going to use. Ein clenches his fists and thinks that he can leave everything as it is if it's about him. But just think that the examiner insulted not only Lloyd San and Chris San, who taught him fencing, he also insulted his mother. Ein activates his skill and says that he cannot forgive the man for these words. He screams in shock about what they are. He sees pseudo hands above Ein. He demands an explanation from Ein. He replies that he is not obliged to explain anything. He doesn't remember such a section in the rules. His eyes are full of determination, and he is ready to fight. The examiner smiles, looking at Ein. The same one stands, clutching a sword, with magical hands hanging over him. The examiner says, well well, he has no idea what this skill is, but if one or two extra hands helps him become stronger, then so be it. The man rushes to attack and says which is good, he attacks. Ein also rushes to attack. The man smiles and tells Ein that it is true that the frequency of his attacks has increased however. This is not always enough. Man and Ein fight like this that the stones are flying to the side. The examiner says that this is all he needs to do. Ein tells the man that he dealt with his phantom hand so easily. Is even their call not enough to defeat him? In this case Ein must absorb even more magical power. He strengthens his arms. The man smiles telling Ein that this way he can strengthen his arms. Ein replies that this time he will attack. And then Ein rushes to attack. The man jumps to the side and shouts to Ein that if he continues like this, he will now destroy the entire field Ein jumps and raises his sword to attack the man. He tells Ein with a smile that he seems to be pretty exhausted, strengthening his arms. Ein attacks the man, but he holds the sword with both hands blocks his attack. Ein tells the man that he thinks it's normal in his position to use both hands, and then another magical hand of Ein appears from the ground. 
The man, angry and tense, tells Ayn not to dare look down on him. And the man blocks the blow of Ayn's magical hand with his sword. Ayn is shocked. He increases the pressure on the examiner's sword. The weapon begins to crack. Ayn does his best just like a man. And then everything is swallowed up by a bright flash. Ayn flies to the side. A column of dust rises into the air. The examiner clears his throat of dust and says oh well. What's wrong with this child? This was the first time he had fought face to face with such a person. And Ayn is still standing. This man is truly something. Ayn says that he's really glad to hear that, and now they should continue. The man asks Ayn not to joke like that, saying that there is no point in continuing the exam anymore. To destroy the exam area so badly during an exam is the first time in his memory that this has happened. Looks like the man will now have to request another site for the next classes. Ayn apologizes for destroying the site. He bowed and asked for forgiveness for being unable to control himself out of anger. Ayn thinks that no matter what it looks like, he's seriously screwed now. His words angered him so much that he wanted to defeat the man at any cost. He failed the exam anyway. A man approaches Ayn and says that he understands perfectly well that he was angry because of his words so Ayn passed. He gives Ayn the scroll. Ayn takes it in his hands in shock. The man tells him that this certificate confirms passing the exam, so Ayn cannot lose it. Ayn replies that he was arrogant towards the man. He smiles and tells Ayn that they should keep this just between them. Ayn doesn't have to worry about it. The man grins and leaves. Ayn runs out of the academy and thanks Chris San for waiting for him. He passed the exam. But then he notices that Chris herself is angry. She tells Ayn herself that she congratulates him. He begins to tremble from such a reaction from the girl. He says that Chris herself is angry with him, right? Chris herself tells Ayn that of course she is angry with him. After all, Ayn used him like that. He closes his eyes and swallows. Chris herself tells Ayn that she thinks he promised that he would not use this skill. She felt his aura even standing here. Ayn asks her for forgiveness. Ayn says that even though he knew it was just an exam, he couldn't just let someone talk badly about his time with Chris San and the others, Chris herself calls out to Ayn in shock. She says even so. He shouldn't have used his skill. This skill cannot just be taken and shown to the first person you meet. Of course she understands Ayn's feelings however. Ayn thinks that he can win her over with one more attack Ayn tells Chris Salma that he still seriously injured the examiner. Will he be okay? Chris herself says that there is a very experienced healer at the academy. Therefore, the examiner is always prepared for such an outcome. Chris herself continues, saying that the examiners are also experienced retired adventurers, so they are very hardy. Therefore, Ayn herself, who is capable of personally injuring the examiner, will receive a couple of extra points. Ayn thinks that his examiner turned out to be an experienced adventurer. So now it's clear why he was so strong. However, Chris herself tells Ayn that an incident of this magnitude will definitely reach his majesty's ears, so Ayn should be prepared. He understands everything. A few days later, Ayn sits and listens to a lecture from his majesty. The king tells Ayn that perhaps he will stop his words there. Olivia asks her father not to be so mean to Ayn. The same one, in a trembling voice, asks for forgiveness from his grandfather. The king tells Ayn that it doesn't matter despite this. Before this, they didn't advertise this, but Ayn is already seven years old. He should start getting used to acting like a crown prince, as an heir. The king continues, telling Ayn that he therefore plans to send him to practice in the port city of Magna. Olivia hugs Ayn by the shoulders with a smile and tells him that this would be his first job as crown prince. Ayn says in shock that public practice awaits him. At this time, the ship with Lady Klein is sailing on the sea. The man asks her to return to her cabin. The proof of their promise at sea shines even brighter. Lady Klein tells Grandpa that she will do so. On her hand hangs a rose given to her by Ayn. The king asks Ina, take a good look around. What his grandson is now looking at is the pride of the Ishtalik navy. Ayn looks at the battleships. Ayn stands on the pier and looks at the warships. His first public case awaits him. Ayn says that there are so many large warships here. He asks what it means that there is also a military base in Magna. Christina tells Ayn yes with a smile. She is responsible for protecting their borders. The port city of Magna is one of the three largest cities of Ishtalik. Usually in the morning the shops are crowded with fishermen selling their catch. And literally within walking distance of them is one of the Ishtaliki military bases. Ayn thinks that his job today is just watching the ships, and the state of the city itself. In addition, he must also oversee the first delivery of magic stones. This delivery came from Euros according to the contract signed by his mother. The king, along with Ayn and Christina, approaches the boxes and tells Ayn that he will now show him a couple of raw sea magic stones. He asks Chris to open the drawers. 
She answers the king yes and readily takes out her sword. She cuts off the lock with one blow of her sword. She invites the king and Ayn to watch. He looks at Ayn in shock and thinks about that Chris herself just cut the lock. Or it was magic. Chris herself did it as usual, but her attack was too fast. Ayn picks up the stone and says that these are sea magic stones. Ayn turns to his grandfather with a smile and says that these magical stones actually resemble rock salt. The king of Ishtaliki laughs, telling Ayn that he is right. The king of Ishtaliki tells Ayn that okay, Ayn's public work is finished for today. Ayn tells his grandfather that it was truly an interesting and educational experience. He says thank you very much to his grandfather. Ayn immediately asks him if he has a little more time. He asks his grandfather if he can go and look around. He wants to find a souvenir for his mother. The king of Ishtaliki smiles and answers Ayn of course, he can go and look around. Ayn says that his mother was very upset that she could not go with them today. He remembers how Olivia, hugging her son, shouted to the king how her father could be so cruel. Does he want to separate them from Ayn? He recalls that his mother immediately backed down in the argument when she read the letter her grandfather gave her. He wonders what was written in that letter. Christina smiles and tells Ayn that she thinks Olivia has realized that today will be a memorable day for Ayn herself. He replies that if this is so then, grandfather asks Ayn if he can wait for them a little. They finish their business at the port. There is something that needs to be checked with Chris herself. Ayn tells them that yes of course he can wait for them. Grandfather tells him okay, then he will order that he be prepared. Ayn points to the pier and says that he rarely goes to the sea, so he would really like to take a closer look at it. Christina screams at Ayn that she can't let this happen. Even though Ayn is on a military base, it is still very dangerous. Grandpa tells Chris no no. The king of Ishtaliki tells Ayn that in that case he should wear this. Ayn asks his grandfather what it is as he puts a chain around his neck. The king of Ishtaliki answers Ayn that this is the great earthly ruby. This is a powerful magical artifact capable of creating impenetrable dragon protection around the wearer. He is able to protect his wearer in any case. Chris herself says that in this case she will allow it, but only this time. But Chris herself asks Ayn not to go far. Ayn answers her well. In this case he will wait until they finish all their business. Ayn stands on the pier and smiles, he's very happy. And he thinks in admiration about how clear the sky is above him. He notices the fish splashing in the ocean. Ayn says that autumn has already arrived, but today it is so warm here. This is a great day to sleep under the open sky. Ayn says that if he were not the crown prince, he could fall asleep right here. Ayn looks around and thinks about, what wait, what if no one finds out that he slept here? Ayn sits between the boxes and says that thinking about all this. After all, no one has yet officially announced that he is the crown prince, so this is his last chance to do it. Ayn lies down and closes his eyes. He says with a smile that the shadow from these boxes is just perfect. Yes, this is not bad at all. Ayn lies in the shadow of the boxes. A bird lands on one of the boxes, and there is silence all around. Ayn thinks about how good he feels. Noise inlet sounds just like a lullaby. Ayn thinks about it, that round heart is also a port city. A little nostalgia wouldn't hurt him. He remembers his childhood. Ayn remembers how he stands in the middle of a field of flowers and tells his mother that it is here. Olivia says with a smillion that he will fall if he runs like that. Ayn inhales the scent of flowers. He tells his mother with a smile that these flowers smell so nice. Olivia asks him with a smile what really. She leans towards the one held out to Hirina flower and inhales the smell. She tells her son that yes, the flowers have a very pleasant smell. But then Ayn starts sneezing. Mom worriedly asks him what happened. Ayn thinks about what tickles him. Then he opens his eyes and sees a blurry silhouette in front of him. He thinks that no, this cannot be. He wanted to take a little nap on the pier. And this floral smell, where could he have inhaled it? Then Lady Klein turns to Ayn and calls him. She talks about what interests her what he will tell her first. It will be, long time no see or gratitude for the fact that she lent him her knees. Ayn shudders after these words. Ayn lies with his head in Lady Klein's lap. She looks into his eyes and smiles. Ayn takes one strand of her hair and says that the words, I wanted to meet you will not be enough. Ayn says to Klein with a smile. She presses his palm to her chest and shyly tells Ayn that she is also happy. A little later, Ayn and Lady Klein are sitting on boxes and looking out to sea. Lady Klein tells Ayn that she was so surprised when she learned that Ayn was a member of the royal family. Ayn tells Lady Klein that he was surprised too when I found out about it. Lady Klein continues, saying that when she found out about all this, she thought that now they would never see each other again. Ayn tells her no, saying that they are talking right now, right now. Lady Klein looks at Ayn and smiles. Here Ayn asks Lady Klein if she came herself. She tells him no, saying that she sailed with her grandfather and several maids. She points her finger behind Ayn and asks him to look, 
There is her grandfather, and he is not alone. Ein says that this is what Archduke Augustus is. He really does have a very strange aura about him. Lady Klein corrects Ein, saying that her grandfather is a former Archduke. He doesn't understand why this happened. Lady Klein tells Ein that her grandfather is already old. Therefore, before sailing here, he transferred the headship of the family to her father. Lady Klein continues, saying that after her retirement, her grandfather took her to the market town of Birdland. However, in the middle of the journey they went missing. Well, at least that's what they should have said. Lady Klein says that after this, and not without the help of Olivia herself, they boarded a ship from Euro to Ishtaliki. She ends by saying that otherwise, if in Heim he learned that part of the Archduke's family was heading to a country that had severed all relations with it, then her father would have problems. Ein tells Lady Klein that for this he asks her forgiveness. She sheepishly tells Ein that God, he doesn't owe her an apology for this. It all doesn't matter anymore. But she is interrupted by Christina, who approaches them and thanks Ein herself for waiting for them. Ein asks Chris and says that she has already finished her work. She answers him yes, she left the rest to Warren herself. Ein tells Chris herself to let him introduce her to Lady Klein, she. Chris herself raised her hands and smilingly told Ein that she had already met Klein herself and Count herself. Christina adds, saying that while Ein himself was sleeping on the pier, Ein is confused. And Chris herself asks the latter for Morneverdon do anything like that Ein smiles and says that yes yes, he will remember all this. Christina tells him well, now they should return to Magma. She adds that if Klein wasn't tired herself, she wouldn't want to join them. Lady Klein tells her that yes, she would be happy to join them. Here Lady Klein curtsies and addressing Ein as his highness the crown prince, asks his permission for her to join him. Ein and Christina look at her in shock. Afterwards Ein shyly tells her yes with pleasure. He extends his hand to Lady Klein and you accept it with a smile. Later, Olivia and Lady Klein are sitting at the table. Lady Klein tells Olivia, addressing her as her highness, that she second the princess and expresses great gratitude to her for the help she and her grandfather provided. And he also thanks them for helping to prepare everything. Olivia raises her hands and, smiling, tells Klein herself that everything is fine, she shouldn't worry Olivia says it's weird to use it towards herself. And he asks Klein what she thinks about it. In addition, Olivia becomes sad when he addresses her as a princess, so Lady Klein could not talk the same way as when they first met Lady Klein says that then she will call her Olivia herself. She answers yes with a smile. Lady Klein is worried. She asks Olivia if she can find out what she wanted to tell her. Olivia asks Lady Klein what her plans are for the future. What is she going to do next? Olivia tells Lady Klein that it's just the two of them in the room right now. Therefore, there is no need to hide anything Lady Klein clenches her fists on her knees. She's very worried. Olivia asks Lady Klein what brings her to Ichalika. Lady Klein recalls that before how to meet Ein, Varen herself asked her a similar question. Lady Klein shows the rose in her palms that Ein gave her and says that she received it from the prince's crowns, so she crossed the ocean to meet him again. But then Lady Klein was asked what brought her to Ishtalik. However, now Olivia herself asks her what her intentions are about her relationship with Ein. She tells Olivia herself to tell her the truth. She's not sure she has the right to do this. Olivia says with a smile that it's good then. Olivia asks Lady Klein if she is going to live in Ishtalik for the rest of her life. Lady Klein says that if this was her question, then from the moment she left August's estate, she was ready for this. Olivia smiles shyly, and then he happily says that if this is so, then there are no problems. Olivia gets up and leaves, telling Klein son that she will then get her into the same academy starting next spring. This academy is slightly different from the one Ein attended. This is a women's academy, in which her mother, the queen, works as a director. Olivia tells Klein herself that they are the royal family, they will prepare the perfect place where a diamond like Klein herself will be polished to a shine. And if Klein herself can shine brighter than other diamonds, then no one will dare to refuse or object to her. Olivia takes Lady Klein's hand and asks her to please let her help her shine. Lady Klein wipes away her tears and answers Olivia with a smile of course. Ein sits and reads books. A maid approaches him and tells Ein herself that it is already dark. She asks him not to stress so much. He answers Mark saying thank you very much. Ein takes a sip of tea. He takes a pen and says what is good. He will immediately finish one exercise and that's enough for today. Ein continues to study. He finishes the exercise. Ein stretches out his arms and stretches happily, saying that that's all for today. But then someone approaches him from behind. Ein shouts in shock. It is Lady Klein who asks Ein with a smile if he is not overdoing it. Ein screams at Klein in shock about what she is doing here. Lady Klein tells Ein that her classes are already over. So she decided to stop by and check on Ein. He tells Lady Klein that if, if it was possible, 
He would like Klein to greet him in a more normal way Lady Klein tells Ayn that in the end he didn't notice that she came because Ayn was too concentrated. But she saw something good. Lady Klein tells Ayn that she feels she should put even more effort into her studies now. Ayn asks the Lady Klein that's for sure she heard. Most likely my mother's return will be celebrated soon. Lady Klein tells him yes. Varen herself had already invited her and her grandfather as guests. Ayn tells her that he understands. He says that he believes that if Klein goes, then everything will be fine with her. However, is he allowed to attend this celebration? After all, no one has yet announced to the people who he is. Lady Klein tells Ayn that there are some good ways around this. They start discussing it and laughing. Later Ayn asks Klein on when she goes to bed. She tells him that, to be honest, she was just getting ready to go to the bathroom. Ayn says he understands her. Well the bathroom here is really big, so he should really enjoy the bath. Lady Klein asks Ayn if he wants to join her. He immediately screams about what he doesn't want. Ayn yells at Lady Klein to go take a bath now and stuff like that. She smiles and tells Ayn that they should leave it for next time. Later, the palace celebrates the return Olivia. Many guests drink, socialize and enjoy the holiday. Lady Klein approaches the lonely Ayn and asks for forgiveness. She asks him if he waited too long for her. Her dress flutters in the air. Lady Klein tells Ayn that she needed to keep Grandpa company and meet some people, so she was a little late. Ayn looks at Lady Klein in shock and confusion, amazed by her appearance. Ayn tells Lady Klein that yes, everything is fine. This dress looks great on her. Lady Klein thanks Ayn, saying that he also looks great in a formal suit. Later they stand together in the common room. Lady Klein says yes, this is truly a wonderful celebration. Ayn tells her that since their arrival there has not been such a thing in Ishtalik that would not surprise her. Even this steam train, this is his first ride on it. And it's not even this that's surprising, but the fact that absolutely anyone can ride it. And those city lights, they are so mesmerizing and beautiful. This feeling that you look at beautiful jewelry collected in one dark box. Lady Klein says that besides all this, she is amazed at how magic stones are not processed in this country. Just think that magic stones can be used in everyday routine. Lady Klein continues, saying that she is somewhat taken aback by how different James' common sense is from here. Ayn tells Lady Klein that she doesn't really have anything to worry about. Until she touches the stone, nothing will happen to her. Here Ayn tells Lady Klein that by the way, this is also his first experience of attending such parties. After all, up to this point no one had said anything about him. Lady Klein asks Ayn if they told him about when he will be announced to the whole world Ishtalik. Ayn tells her that if he is not mistaken, then this will happen next spring. They told him they would do this before Lady Klein, and he officially went to the academy. Lady Klein responds to Ayn, okay, then he should prepare a speech. She asks Ayn what he thinks about taking cues from people he admires. Ayn tells Lady Klein that, to be honest, he would like to become like the first king. So apparently he'll have to learn to speak more rudely, in an old man's voice. Lady Klein tells Ayn, well he has a very pleasant and relaxing way of speaking after all. Then Ayn and Lady Klein hear a conversation between two men. One of them talks about that he doesn't understand what the prime minister is thinking at all. Why did he invite people from Haim to the party? Yes, they only dirty the floors of their castle. And then they notice that all the people around are standing in groups, looking at them and whispering. Ayn gets angry hearing such words. But then Lady Klein pulls him by the hand and calls him. She tells Ayn that everything is fine, and he shouldn't worry. Instead, they should just enjoy the party. Lady Klein smiles. And she continues by saying that, for sure, she remembered that she had recently seen some delicious-looking dishes. She'll take some so please let Ayn just wait here for her. Lady Klein leaves and Ayn only has time to shout after her, wait. Then Warren approaches him and asks Ayn Sama why he is alone and where his girlfriend is. Where is Lady Klein? Ayn replies that she went to get herself some food. Warren asks about yes anyway, he came to say that his majesty had prepared several gifts for Ayn herself. Warren asks Ayn to wait for them a little. He doesn't understand what Warren means. Warren talks about how it relates to that dinner party in Heim. It seems that his majesty is really worried about this incident. The king of Ishtaliki waves to Ayn. Grandfather says with a smile. Warren adds that by the way, he also thought that talking about him and his status at this party would be a good idea. Then Ayn hears the sound of a plate breaking. He turns around in shock. Lady Klein stands and presses her hands to her chest, looking at the man. Pieces of a broken plate of food lie in front of her. Man says Lady Klein, calling her a hillbilly from Heim, that how dare she come to this party. She silently looks at the man, still holding her hands to herself. Warren talks about what a stubborn nobleman the man is. Now he will take care of him. Then Warren turns his head and realizes that Ayn herself is no longer next to him. The man reaches out to Lady Klein and says that now he will show her her place. 
but then Ayn comes between them and blocks the man's hand with his hand. He says that he asks for forgiveness, but does he really have any business with his guest? The man grins and talks about what he sees. What did he say after he dared to interrupt him? Is this girl his guest? Is this deaf girl was not invited by the prime minister? The man tells Ayn that he doesn't know whose child it is, but there is a line he definitely shouldn't cross. Therefore, if Ayn really loves and thinks about Ishtalik, then it is normal for them to hate Haim. All the people immediately support the man, saying that this is true. They can't forgive them for what they did to Olivia herself. After all, they are the most simplesiviges, nothing more. Lady Klein puts his hand on Ayn's shoulder and tells him that he shouldn't. He thinks that it has overtaken him again. Just at the moment when there was no place for him and his mother in the palace. Heim. This doesn't mean that Klein is to blame for their mistake. Then everything was like that because she had no power with which he could be recognized. And that day his mother saved him by taking him Teuchtelik. That's why this time with his current strength he... Ein clenches his fists, Ein tells the man that if he feels hostility or irritation about Kaima, then let him express all his complaints to him right now, and he will definitely listen to them. The man and all the people around him stared at Ein in shock. Warren chuckled at his words. Ein tells the man that he is unhappy with the crown prince who was deprived of his status because of Haim after all. His feelings were heard. Man screams in shock anew, no no, he has no grievances or complaints towards the crown prince. Ayn raises his palm and tells the man that he has no intention of blaming the latter for this. Ayn says that this all happened because he was weak. He was a burden to his mother. Yes, he was an order of magnitude weaker than his younger brother, was abandoned by his own father, and was ultimately deprived of his own inheritance. So it's normal that they despise someone like him. Ayn puts his hand to his heart and says that however in the end he met a Ladekline, and he got the opportunity to prove to himself. Ein goes to the table on which there is a magic crystal and says that he wants to apologize to all people for his weakness and uncertainty absolutely in everything. But that won't be a problem for him anymore. Ein touches the magic crystal. The man standing behind Ein shouts in shock at him to move away from the stone and asks him if he wants to die. Ein asks everyone not to worry about him. Ein absorbs magic from the crystal. All the people froze, looking at him in shock. They don't understand how it happened that the blue magic stone became transparent. Ayn raises the crystal with one hand and says to everyone that as they see, now he will not lose to monsters in strength. And this magic stone is proof of that. Therefore, he wants to ask all the guests something. This strength is worthy strength for the first king. Ayn loudly shouts to all the guests that who here still thinks that Ishtaliki has no pride. Are there any here or not? The king of Ishtaliki is shocked and says that Ayn is just like. He looks at Ayn and sees strength at someone else. Ein tells the guests that if they have any complaints, they should direct them directly at him. And if they still have any complaints directly to him, then they can come to the castle at any time. Ein raises his hand holding the crystal upward and says that his name is Ein. He is Ein von Ishtalika. And as the crown prince, he promises everyone present that he will become a king who will rule Ishtalika just like the first king did. All the guests look at Inshakana and they say that he is the crown prince of his highness. Ein adds, saying that if they can accept him, then please let Lady Klein as well. Ein remains standing with Lady Klein in the middle of the hall. He thinks about how he did it again. What was he thinking? But then Lady Klein tells Ein that they are all. And then he notices that all the people in the hall knelt down in front of him. King Ishtaliki closed his eyes, speaking clearly. Ein thinks that from that very day, he became the crown prince of Ishtaliki. Fireworks are set off in the city. Hundreds of people came to the palace to see Ein. He stands and waves his objects. A couple of days after he announced himself as the heir to the throne at a party in honor of his mother, he was also announced to all residents of Ishtalik. Guests say that Ayn was so brave at the last party. Someone supports the speaker by saying that he agrees. Ayn didn't even flinch from the limitless power of the magic stone Ayn is truly a great person. The girls say that Ayn was so crazy as to stand up for the arriving lady from another continent. And yes, this act struck the ladies to the very depths of their souls. It's just like a scene from a fairy tale Warren hears these men's words and smiles. Lady Klein brings a glass of water to Ein, who is sitting on a chair, and tells him that he has done a good job. He thanks Klein. Olivia stands next to her son. The king is watching Themish Talaki, who exhales, saying that although this happened unexpectedly, he is glad that the announcement of Ina went smoothly. Warren says that apparently the nobles thought very highly of Ein herself. Apparently rumors spread about his performance at the party. The king of Ishtaliki says yes, that's all true. Of course he would like to punish Ayn for this, but he has already made him go through a lot with his previous family. Warren says it doesn't matter what Ayn Sama said at the party she's. The king Ishtaliki says yes. 
Ein Sama's speech is very similar to that of the first king. Warren says he never told Ein about her. But most likely Ein herself became very interested in the first king and therefore read a lot of literature about him. Warren talks about continuing to talk about surprise. He recently received a response from Lady Klein. He says Lady Klein promised to post go all out when you start at the Women's Academy next spring. And to help her a little, he decided to give her the opportunity to choose one of three types of training. The King of Ishtaliki asks Warren what type of training the Lady Isklein chose. He replies that he is the first this path to becoming an official just like him. The second type is the road of becoming a Rudite Queen. And the third path is the path of becoming a princess who will influence people's lives. The King of Ishtaliki again asks Warren what path Lady Klein chose. He replies that Lady Klein said that she wants to become an erudite lady with a significant influence on people's lives and capable of protecting the king himself. The king of Ishtaliki is shocked and says with a smile that this is so. Lady Klein chose all three types. The king of Ishtaliki says that not only Ein, but the gods also blessed Lady Klein with a new generation. Warren tells the king that he agrees. They look at them and see a beautiful couple in the future. For now, these are just happy little children. Ein tells Lady Klein that they are going to different academies. She tells him that it is so, but they still need to give it their all. Olivia immediately hugs her son and says that she might also move to the academic town in order to see Ein more often. But then someone tells Olivia herself that she can't. This is Christina, who approaches them and tells Olivia herself that she even imagines what a fuss and fuss there would be if someone like her appeared in such a crowded place as an academic campus. Olivia sighs and hugs her son, saying that she knows about it. She's just a little worried about Ina. Christina smiles and says that she will accompany him, so there is no need to worry about Ina. Olivia asks Ein that Chris is a little frivolous sometimes if he agrees. He says yes to his mother with a smile. Lady Klein tells Ein that they have to go. He turns his head to the girl and says that yes, she is right. And he tells his mother that then he will go. Olivia tells her son to be careful on the way to the academy. But then Olivia calls her son before leaving, he turns his head to his mother. Olivia asks her son to enjoy his school life with a smile Ein says okay to mom with a smile Ein walks with Chris herself through the busy courtyard of the academy. He waves to the departing Lady Klein, and she waves back Chris herself brings Ein into the thick of the crowd. Ein wearily says that this place is even more crowded compared to when he took the introductory hin exchange, he doesn't even want to imagine how he will walk through this street every single day Chris smiles herself and tells Ein that he shouldn't worry because she will make sure he can get to his school safely every day. Ein sighs tiredly and says thank you to Chris herself. Chris herself tells Ein that that's why he shouldn't worry so much, because this road is his only difficulty on the way to school. And when they get to school, Ein will feel truly at ease. Ein thinks about Chris's words herself, thinking how he can feel at ease in the best school in Ishtaliki. He cannot even imagine such a development of events Chris herself and Ein enter the richly furnished Courtyard Academy. They approach the large main gate. Ein looks excitedly at the gate and thinks that this is how he will attend this school from today Chris herself tells Ein that at this stage she is forced to say goodbye to him. But he needn't worry. While he is at the academy, another person will take care of his safety instead. Ein shocked asks Chris herself who it will be Chris herself turns and calls for someone named Dill to come to them. A young guy approaches them and falls on one knee in front of Ein. He tells Ein that he is honored to meet his majesty. Chris herself asks Ayn for permission to introduce Herdsilt Galanta. This is the son of Lloyd Sama and Marky San. Ayn is shocked that Lloyd herself and Mark are married. Ayn looks at Dil Gallant sitting on his knee in front of him and asks in shock that he is the son of Lloyd and Marky. Chris herself tells Ayn that although Dil Gallant is still a novice knight, he is still head and shoulders above his peers. She believes that Dil is able to protect Ayn while he is on the academy grounds. Ayn shouts to her, wait, one second. He shouts that Lloyd Sama and Marky San are really married. Chris herself asks Ayn in response that he didn't know about this. She continues, saying that Lloyd and Mark serve his highness together in the castle, which is probably why they don't talk about their personal lives. Ayn talks about it that he didn't even know about it. The guy, still sitting on one knee, says his name is Dil Gallant. And he is very proud that he was chosen to be his majesty's bodyguard. Dil Gallant calls Ayn his highness. He says smelling Dil Gallant too that he is also very pleased to meet you. Chris herself says that by the way, she has messages from the king for Ein. Chris herself raises her finger and conveys the king's words to Ein. When communicating with Dill, do not be formal and do not be modest. Remember this whenever you want to thank him. This is what his highness conveyed to Ein. Simply put, his highness wants Ein to train while interacting with Dill. Ein answers her that he understood her words. He coughs into his fist. 
Afterwards, Ayn extends his hand to Dill, who is still sitting on his knee, and says that he is pleased to meet you. Ayn smiles at the guy. Dill rises from his knees and stands at attention. He says to Ayn, turning to his highness the word thank you. Ayn continues to look at him and smile. Ayn says that from now on, Dill will always be there to protect him, so he can call him Ayn. Dill raises his hand and tells Ayn that he asks to forgive him, but being a bodyguard, he cannot afford to contact Taino. He thinks to himself that Dill turned out to be a very persistent guy. Chris herself tells Ayn that it's good, then when his highness's classes are over, she will wait for him in this very place, and let him not dare to return home with Dill without waiting for her. She asks Ina, did he understand her words? Ayn tells her yes. Chris leaves and waves goodbye to Ayn, asking him not to forget her words. Ayn wonders if his grandfather really thinks he is that unreliable. Although if you remember only about all his recent antics, Ayn walks down the corridor of the academy with Dillam. Ayn tells Dill that's for sure, he remembered something. If he is not mistaken, then this school does not officially admit new students as such. Dill tells Ayn that there is no such thing. Dill tells Ayn that his class will end at noon, so he will give Ayn a tour of the academy after lunch. Ayn tells Dill it's good, in which case he will wait for Ayn in his class. Ayn stops at the door and says that this is really his class. This door is as big and beautiful as expected from a royal academy. Dill tells Ayn that this is second grade. Dill says Ayn that he studies in the first grade, which is here. He leads Ayn to an even larger door. Ayn stands in shock and wonders what kind of giant is in front of him. He asks Dill if the door doesn't stand out too much compared to other classes. Dill tells him that only the best students can study in first grade. Thus, with the help of the door, the academy shows the difference between them and the rest of the students. Dill Gallant continues by saying that this class is a place for those whose abilities and skills in the future will be used for the benefit of the nation, regardless of their origin. This is what Kingsland Academy is really like, putting the students' skills above all else. Ayn says that skills are above all else. Then he will have to try his best. Dill bows his head to Ayn and says that he will come for him a little later. Ayn answers him well. Ayn thinks that stop, he let Dill go but how can he open this door? It doesn't even have a handle. But then the door opens on its own, sensing his approach. Ayn is shocked to think that the door is automatic. They installed such a complex mechanism for a cool door. Ayn walks into his class and all the other students in the audience immediately pay attention to him. Ayn walks around the classroom and thinks about that if he is not mistaken, then there are no more than a dozen students in each class. It turns out that everyone except him was already assembled. Ayn thinks that since there are only a few students here, if he can't get along with at least one of them hell, then it will all be over. Then someone says that he is glad that all the students are in their places. This is a teacher who walks through the classroom and tells the students that it would otherwise be very disappointing if any of the students missed the very first day of school at the academy. The teacher says his name is Rook. At the academy he teaches magical engineering, and from today he is also eyes the homeroom teacher of their class. Teacher Rook adjusts his glasses and says that in fact their class teacher should have been another teacher, but due to certain events he was forced to retire. But okay, students shouldn't take that into their heads. Teacher Rook says that this is a class for special people. Therefore, he expects only one thing from all of them. Everyone, including Ayn, listens to the teacher with interest. Rook talks about what he expects from every on that they will show only the best of the best results. That's all. All students are free. All the students are shocked by his words. Teacher Ruck moves away from the steel and says that yes, he almost forgot. As long as all their results are satisfactory, they may not attend however, they will still need to take tests every six months. Teacher Rook leaves and talks about how if the students need anything, just let her ask the teachers or other staff. They are also free to use all equipment located on the academy's premises, that's all. Ein asks the neighbor with the cat's whiskers if it's normal that they are given so much freedom. His neighbor laughs and says he agrees. He tells Ayn that his name is Roland, and he is pleased to meet Ayn. He took the tests to become a magical engineer during admission, and what Ayn took. He thinks in shock that in front of him is a half-man, half-werewolf. Ayn replies that he took fencing. He, in shock, asks him what, he took fencing in first grade. Roland immediately smiles broadly and says seen that he is the guy everyone is talking about. Ayn asks what it means that everyone is talking about him. Roland tells him yeah. He says that the examiner who took the fencing test is known for his extensive experience as an ex-adventurer, and there are now rumors that that one of the examinees not only defeated him, but also destroyed the arena. Ayn is shocked to think about what everyone at the academy already knows. The students immediately begin to discuss whether Ayn really is the same student from the rumors. How could a child like him defeat the examiner? Ayn smiles embarrassedly and thinks that this is all bad. 
If he doesn't do anything, the students in his class might think of her as someone who may become enraged due to poor condition. Out loud, Ein says that of course they can laugh, but this time the examiner's words forced him to give it his all. Roland talks about how they can laugh at him. No way, Ein is incredible. And then he says that he interrupted Ein and he did not introduce himself to him. Ein only has time to open his mouth and say, I when someone says that a sixth year student, Dil Gallant, has come to them. He comes in and walks around the audience. Roland says that Dil Gallant is the son of the Grand Marshal. Roland asks Ein why he came to their class. Then Roland realizes that Dil Galagni is heading towards them. Dil Gallant approaches Ein and bows before him and says, Your Highness. He completely forgot that this year a free education system was introduced for those entering the first grade. All the students open their mouths in shock after this. Dil Gallant says that in view of all this, if Ein is not busy, then he would like to show him his academy. Roland is shocked and can't say anything. Someone is holding out their hand. It's Ein who shakes Roland's hand and tells him that he's already heard his name Ein, and he's pleased to meet Roland. Ein tells him that Dil is going to show him around the academy. He asks Roland if he wants to join them. He answers in a trembling voice that he is very grateful to Ein for such an invitation however, unfortunately he is forced to refuse as he needs to finish his paperwork. Ein waves to Roland and says with a smile that in that case they will take a walk next time. Roland remains sitting at his desk in shock and says that the student sitting next to him introduced himself Asian. In that case, he is the crown prince. Ein and Dil Gallant inspect the premises of the academy one by one. Dil Gallant tells Ein that here he is and showed him all the most necessary and important places in the academy, about which to him need to know Ein says thank you to him with a smile. This place is simply crammed with interesting places and it's also the size of an entire royal castle. Ein tells Dil that he wanted to ask him, since he must accompany him to the academy the entire time he is there. And in this case, what will happen to Dil's classes and his training? He answers Ein that as he said, sometimes he will not be able to accompany him. However, Dil Galagni will do everything possible to minimize this time. Ein tells him no, he shouldn't. He can't ignore his study schedule and free time. Dil Gallant tells Ein that please he doesn't have to pay attention to these little things of his attention. After all, protecting Ein comes first. Ein thinks about how stubborn Dil Gallant is. Then Ein notices the girls sitting on the lawn. Ein asks Dil Gallant what kind of girls he likes. Does he prefer girls with long hair? What about her character? Does he prefer soft and kind girls? Ein smiles and thinks that talking about girls is the easiest way to get closer to a guy. He is confident that with the help of this, he will be able to get closer even to such a stubborn person as Dil Gallant. But then Ein notices Dil Gallant's reaction to his question and doesn't understand why does someone like this always have such a gloomy look. Dil Gallant asks Ein why he is asking such a question. Ein tells Dil Gallant that he should know at least something about the person who will be next to him most of his free time. Dil Gallant answers him clearly, so what is the reason for this question? Dil Gallant replies that in this case he will prefer a girl who is stronger than him. Ein thinks that Dil is several times stronger than anyone his age, so the only girl that comes to his mind is Chris' son. Dil Gallant says that the girl of his dreams was at least about the same height as his father, and also that such a girl has a developed physique. Ein tells Dil Gallant that if that's the case, he thinks it would be very difficult to find someone matching that description. However, he is confident that Dil Gallant will succeed. He answers Ein with the words thank you very much. However, to tell the truth, every time he tells his friends about this, they start laughing at him and telling him that this is wrong age can therefore, he is very grateful to his majesty for such kind words. Ein thinks that this is it. It was at this very moment that the distance between him and Dil closed. Ein thinks that maybe this is just a small step towards their friendship, however. This is a very important first step for Ein. Ein says out loud with a smile to Dil Gallant that maybe it's not time yet, but he wouldn't like to have dinner with him. There's something else he'd like to talk to him about. Dil Gallant answers, I obey your majesty. Ein imagined a dinner where he and Dil Gallant had a pleasant conversation. But in reality, he sits and eats while Dil stands behind him and looks around at everyone around him. He tells Ein that he will make sure no one sneaks up on him so he can enjoy his lunch in peace. Ein bites the sandwich and thinks that apparently his step was too small. At this time at the women's academy Liba, Lady Klein stands and smiles. All the girls surrounded her. Some of them ask her to please take a walk with her older brother. The other girl says just a second. Actually, she was the first to speak to Lady Klein. So would Lady Klein mind meeting her cousin? Lady Klein raises her hands and says that she is grateful to them for these invitations. However, she is just the daughter of commoners, she has no right to have a relationship with someone from the nobility. She thinks to herself that she knew it, that this topic will be raised in any country. 
The girl shout to Lady Klein that everything is wrong. After all, the Prime Minister himself recognized it, and this is very, very valuable. Every nobleman will fall to his knees just seeing her beauty Lady Klein tells all the girls that she is flattered by their increased concern. However, if she suddenly gets into some kind of trouble, then the Prime Minister will be responsible for this so. Here one of the girls says who thinks Lady Klein is right and asks for forgiveness. The other one supports her and also asks for forgiveness. Lady Klein says that she is very grateful to everyone for appreciating her so much. She thinks they can all get along with them. The girls happily answer her, of course. Lady Klein thinks that although she was able to transfer to this academy however, she does not think that she will be able to stay there for long. In this case, she should make every effort to get classes, which Olivia herself left here in the past. That's why she can't waste a second. Right now she needs to give it her all. At this time, in a dungeon located on the outskirts of Ishtaliki, the guard shouts what the other one told him how he could have escaped. They open the door to one of the dungeons. The guard commander says that this special magical door, which cannot be opened, is not the name of the necessary magical device. How then did the prisoner do it? The guards answer that they don't know. None of the knights on duty at the cell noticed anything suspicious. The commander of the guard shouts to the soldiers to immediately report this to the castle and bring him lists of the knights on duty in the dungeon. The guards immediately rush to carry out the order. The guard commander takes the fugitive's leaflet, it says that he was imprisoned here. Ex-adventurer freed sloth. This is a serial killer who kills people for money. He is a representative of the rarest race of semi-humans even for Ishtaliki. He's a vampire. They must catch him as soon as possible. A man in a cloak sits on a spire surrounded by a flock of bats. He smiles, revealing his fangs. Ein waves to Roland and tells him that they will see each other tomorrow. He waves back and says yes, see you tomorrow. Ein walks with Dil Gallant through the academy. He tells his highness that a week has passed since he entered the Imperial Academy. He asks Ein if he felt any dissatisfaction. Ein tells Dil Gallant that no, he likes everything. However, if there is one thing that stands out, it is the excessive freedom, which sometimes makes him wonder what he should even learn here. However, Ein heard that the first grade teachers were recently changed. At his words, Dil Gallant shuddered. Ein asks him if he has heard anything about it. Dil Gallant tells Ein that the matter cannot be opened to the public however, the former first grade teacher was fired because he had some problems with his ideals and actions. Ein asks in shock that the teacher was fired. Dil Gallant says the teacher's name is Wolf Magnus. He is the third son of the Marquis family, whose relationship with High's ducal family are more than friendly. Wolf is very good at medicine and alchemy, and is familiar with the so-called monster poison. In the past, Wolf Magnus was caught discriminating against commoners, entered the academy, which goes against the policy of the academy itself. And since His Highness decided to enter this particular academy, they began a thorough check of all working personnel, at which time numerous violations were revealed on the part of Wolf Magnus. Dil Gallant says that he also took part in this check. And after reading some papers, he realized that this man did not have even a small part of the dignity of a noble aristocrat. Ein asks Dil Gallant where Wolf Magnus is now. He replies that despite all his destruction, he still remains a member of the Marquis's family. Therefore, instead of severely punishing Wolf Magnus, he was expelled from Ishtaliki and appointed to the post of knight in the border castle. Dil Gallant says that he personally believes that Wolf Magnus should have received a more severe punishment for all his actions. Ein thinks that Dil undoubtedly has a very strong sense of justice. Ein tells Dil Gallant that he thinks so too. In response, he turns to look at him in surprise. Ein says to Dil Gallant that even though he was a member of the royal family, the thought of humiliating or discriminating against people of lower status had never even crossed his mind. And he thinks that very soon everything will change and no one will humiliate anyone. Ein says that he never really saw the differences between ordinary people and members of noble families. For him they were always equal. Dil Gallant says in response, These are wonderful thoughts, your majesty. Ein asks Dil Gallant what about letting go of all formalities during a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. Dil Gallant tells Ein that he is his bodyguard, so he can't afford it. Later, Chris herself leads Ein away, who waves goodbye to Dil Gallant. Then Christina notices two patrolmen. She says Ein herself that asks for his forgiveness, but she has one thing to do with the patrolman. Can she step back for a minute? At Weave he tells her that yes of course. Chris herself shouts to Ein that thank you very much. She says that she will be back now, so please don't let Ein go anywhere or even move. Ein answers with a smile Christina that he understood her. Ein stands alone and looks at the people around him, thinking that this city is really crowded. Then Ein hears someone shouting, please stop. He notices a group of people in the distance, several guys surrounded two girls. They are scared and shaking. Ein thinks about how the girls have the same uniforms as Lady Klein. 
It turns out that they are also students of the Academy of Noble Maidens. The biggest of the guys tells the girl that she knows that nowadays it's dangerous to walk around without bodyguards, and they just want to offer them their services. The girls tremblingly answer that they don't need it. The man reaches out to the girl and tells her to shut her mouth, adding that they should just continue this conversation at home. Then Ein comes to their defense and stands between the girls and the guys and says that don't they see that the girls are scared and could they stop. Ein tells the girls that it's okay, they can just move on. They are shocked and tell him yes. The man leans over to Ein and tells him what he is doing. Didn't his mommy teach him not to meddle in other people's business? What is this? Is he real he'd like to look like a prince to those little ones? The largest of the men says that he doesn't care who Ein is, he'll still teach him a lesson. And in the future, Ein will think three times before getting involved in adult affairs. He rushes to attack Ein, but he easily dodges his blow. And then he grabs the man by the hand and asks him whether he was the first to attack. The man screams in pain. Then one of the men notices that Ina is wearing a Royal Academy uniform. Another man tells him, and what a difference it makes. He's just a child after all. If they all attack him together, then they'll just crush you. Then Ayn raises his hands and tells the men that no, he apologizes he. Ayn is shaking with fear and looking somewhere into the distance. Men seeing him such reaction they laugh, saying that it's worth just watching, as this bird began to sing, you just had to intimidate him with numbers. Apparently Ayn only now realized that there were three of them here. The man tells Ayn that if he kneels in front of them and begs for mercy then, but then all three men fall to the ground, Christina walks past them and says that didn't she tell Ayn not to move. And although his act is noble, he could not have warned her about it first. Ayn says that Chris herself is absolutely right. She tells Ayn that since he understood everything, then okay. She puts her palm to her face and talks about why he always gets into such trouble. Ayn replies that he simply could not stand still and watch them abuse the girls. Chris herself tells Ayn that she will report this to his majesty. Ayn comes home with Chris herself and walks through the hall, surrounded by ladies. Christina pats Ayn on the head and asks him that isn't he glad it all ended with a 50-page essay and a little scolding from his majesty. Olivia tells Ayn that she was really worried about him this time. Ayn replies that yes, apparently he was in a bit of a hurry that time. Chris herself asks Laurel Sama if she could punish him too. This is the queen of Ishtaliki Laurel. She belongs to the race of dark elves. She answers the question asked of her that perhaps it would be right, but she thinks that Ayn did a very cool thing. As you would expect from Ayn Kun. Chris calls Laurel herself. She continues, saying that however, at the same time she agrees with his majesty and Chris herself says that Ayn's actions were too controversial for a crown prince. She continues by telling Ayn that his grandmother wants to give him something today rather than punish him. Ayn asks why they went down to the treasury. And then Laurel says that here he is. This is a pitch black dagger. Laurel asks Ayn that this would not be the perfect complement to the magic stone of Dullahan, which Ayn absorbed. This dagger is ideal for black knights. Ayn replies that is it normal that he not only absorbed a national level magic stone, but also. Laurel tells Ayn that he is the crown prince, so isn't it normal to use everything to strengthen, what the state has only just managed to accumulate. Olivia asks Ayn to at least try to take him. Ayn says good. Ayn picks up a pitch black dagger. Ayn clutches the dagger and thinks about it what a feeling this is. It felt like the weapon had merged with his hand, and this dagger became her true continuation. Laurel asks Ayn how he likes the gift. He tells his grandmother that he thanks her very much for such an incredible dagger. Olivia and Laurel hug Tojtharin, what a cutie he is. He became even cuter. Ayn thinks that this is how he got his magic dagger. His grandmother gave it to him. He told Lady Klein all this. She tells Ayn that this dagger is perfect for him. Ayn says thank you very much to Lady Klein. Kadim appeals to Lady Klein and Ayn, apologizing for interrupting their conversation however. She asks Ayn if he could listen to her first, and then discuss the gift Ayn apologizes to her. Kadima says that she means that cursed magic stone that Ayn bought from the Magilica's magic stone store Ayn asks Kadima if she was able to find out anything about this stone. Kadima tells him no, and to be honest she doesn't think she can. She can't even study it properly. Kadima asks Ayn if he doesn't have any ideas Ayn asks Kadima that maybe they should check out the Kingsland Royal Academy Library. There are many more books in it than in the castle. Kadima tells Ayn that actually she has Beanie read all the books about magic stones that were kept here, but she doesn't remember that at least one of these books wrote anything about this stone. Ayn says well apparently they will have problems with this. Kadima speaks back, God, what a useless crown prince their country has. Here Ayn takes Kadima by the ears. She screams that she has very sensitive ears, so please stop holding her by them. 
Ein lets Katama go, and she rubs her ears, talking about what a hot-tempered nephew she has. Lady Klein tells Ein that they can't resort to violence so quickly. Ein responds by asking her for forgiveness and saying that he is sorry. This is just how it usually happens. Lady Klein usually screams. Katama says that it all got out of control. She thinks they have one way. Katama takes out a stone in a glass box and tells Ein to touch it a little. He replies that this is too cruel a method Ein asks Katama that as soon as she called him here, she wanted him to do this, he's right. Katama tells Ein that he is not hopeless after all. Katama says that she thinks nothing will happen if he just tries. Well, if something happens, they can easily seal the magic stone. What if this is the only way to find out something? Lady Klein asks Ein if he is sure. He tells her that in the end he was the one who brought this damn stone to the palace, so he should at least try. Ein asks Lady Klein to step back a little just in case. Katama takes the glass in both hands and says that then she removes the sealing glass majolica. Then Ein senses something. He doesn't understand what just happened. Katama removes the glass and invites Ein to try to pick up the stone for now. Ein looks at the stone and it seems to hint that something is pulsating in it. Ein takes the stone and hears the words, I finally found you. This voice is heard not only by him, but also by Katama and Lady Klein. They don't understand whose voice it is. Katama shouts to Ein to quickly return the magic stone under the protective glass. But then his phantom hands appear around Ein. He doesn't understand why there are four of them. Katama shouts about what's going on and that Ein doesn't need to activate the phantom hands. He just needs to put the magic stone back on protection and as quickly as possible. Ein tells her that he did not call them, they did it themselves. Ein screams that his body is absorbing this magic stone by itself. Then Katama jumps on Ein entering to cover the stone in his hands is like glass Ein screams and Katama shouts at him not to touch the stone anymore and to let it go. She and Ein fall to the floor and everything is consumed by a small explosion. But in the end, Katama manages to cover the magic stone with protective glass. When everything calms down, Lady Klein runs to Katama and Ein. They both lie on the floor and breathe heavily. He does not understand what is happening to him and asks why his body is so heavy. Katama rubs his eyes and tells Ein that he used phantom hands at the same time as absorbing the stone, it is clear that he was very tired. But then Katama and Lady Klein notice something. They open their eyes in shock and say Ein, what is his hand? Then Ein himself opens his eyes in shock and looks at his hand, covered with protective armor with strange patterns. Ein sits on the floor, looking at his hand in disbelief, asking what it is. His entire right arm is covered in armor. Lady Klein and Katama look at him in shock as well. Then one of them loudly asks what is going on here. The magic stone still remains covered, covered with protective magic glass. Ein shouts about what kind of armor is on his arm. Katama tells Ein that he has absorbed more than she told him. She asked to absorb just a little bit. Ein says no, that actually he just wanted to support him and that's all. Ein says that he did not control his body, which was trying to absorb the energy of the magic stone. Now he understands what Magilica San meant. He remembers how he talked with Majolica San about the resonance of magic stones. Majolica San said that this is only possible between special magic stones. After all, even creatures with magic stones inside had some kind of connection with other creatures while they were alive. Isn't this romantic? Majolica San gets distracted and talks about why he started all this. Magic stones of the Dullahan and the Demon Lord. They both have a strong resonance with each other. He continues by saying that in the past, two dozen people witnessed an incredible release of magical energy when these two magical stones were placed side by side. The release of energy is a sign of resonance between the stones. According to witnesses of this ejection, the stones seem to be trying to get as close to each other as possible. Ein says that it looked as if the stones had their own consciousness. Majolica San tells Ein that this is why he asks his young prince to be extremely careful. Majolica tells the young prince that the damned magic stone that Ein recently bought from him by chance could not attract his attention. In the present, Ein looks in shock at the stone lying under the glass dome. Then someone shouts from behind the door, calling Kadima San, and saying that some loud sound was just heard from inside the room. The speaker asks if Kadima is okay. She screams in horror that it was Chris San who came. Kaktima runs towards Ein, waving his arms and saying that Chris will be very angry if he sees Ein like this. She screams at him to make that armor disappear as quickly as possible. Ein says that even if Kadima asks him to do it, how can he do it? Kadima shouts to Lady Klein not to stand there like a pillar, but to try to somehow detain Chris San. Lady Klein shouts to Chris San to wait, adding that now the room is a little messy, so... But she doesn't have time to finish. Chris herself recognizes her by her head and says that this room is always a mess and she comes in. 
and when Chris San comes in, he sees Ayn sitting on the floor and Katama and Lady Klein standing above them. Ayn's hands were back to normal, but the room itself was in disarray. Chris herself asks Ayn what he is doing again. Katama replies that, well, something like that. Ayn looks at his hand and thinks in surprise that it was close. But why did the armor suddenly disappear? Kadma asks Chris San what kind of box she brought. She replies that this parcel was addressed to Kadma Sami. She immediately begins to tear the box into pieces, thinking about what lies inside. And then Ayn, Chris herself and Kadma herself look into the box. Kadma shouts joyfully that finally the book she ordered a month ago has arrived. Kadama immediately tells Chris Sama that she just needs to send something. Maybe she can help with it. Chris herself tells Kadama that of course she can. Ayn talks about how beautiful the book's cover is and how expensive it must be. Kadama says the book is the same as her annual salary. Lady Klein asks Kadama what is so interesting about this book. Kadama asks Lady Klein that she is interested in this question. She says that this book was written by an elf who devoted his entire life to writing it. This book is about a demon lord. Ayn repeats the words about the demon lord in shock. Kadama eagerly rubs her hands and tells everyone that it's worth a look, what's so interesting here. She opens the book, and Ayn, standing behind her, asks Kadama what is written there. Kadama shouts this in shock. Kadama tells Ayn that she cannot read this book. Kadama falls wearily on his back and says that the book is written in ancient elvish, which is very, very difficult to translate. Only a few living elves can speak it. Ayn asks Kadama that since the book is written in ancient elvish, then maybe Chris Sen can read it. Kadama sadly tells him no, no. Chris herself has lived in the capital too long, so this is impossible. Now she will have to start looking for someone who can translate this book. Then Lady Klein looks at the book and calls out to Ayn. She points to the person in the picture and asks him if he is familiar to him. Kadama also looks at the image and says that perhaps this is Dullahan himself. Ayn shouts that the Dullahan looks just like a human. Lady Klein tells Ayn that he is similar to the Dullahan. He embarrassedly asks her for the truth. Kadama shouts that she wants not only to look at the pictures, but also to understand what is written here. She asks for forgiveness, saying that she cannot do this. Lady Klein says they will go too then. Kadama leaves, shouting to Chris herself that she will be out for a while and asks her to please take care of the package. She answers Kadama of course and asks her to be careful. Chris turns her head and looks at something. She asks about the fact that the same book from the parcel is on the table. She tells Kadama San how she can leave such an expensive thing on the table. Chris herself wonders what interests her, what is so special about this book. She reads the title on the cover, A Biography of a Demon Lord and His Minions. Chris herself looks around and thinks that everything will be alright if she looks into the book. She opens it and looks at the picture of a beautiful girl. Chris herself understands that this girl is an ancient lick. Then she remembers the parcel. Teacher Rook tells the students in class that the details are described on the sheets they were given. If they have any questions, they can ask them. Ayn looks at his paper in shock and talks about the district academic competition. Roland tells Ayn that this is an annual event held to build relationships between the academies in the area. Ayn Sight reads about public speaking, fencing, magic. He says there are a lot of competitions here. Ayn asks Roland about what and which competition their class will take part in. He answers Ayn with a smile that they are not participating. Ayn asks him why. Roland replies that their Royal Academy, or rather the first and second classes, have too great a difference in ability compared to other classes their age. Ayn tells Roland that he talks about it so casually. Roland continues, saying that this is why only third grade students will take part in the competition. Ayn looks at his sheet and begins to understand why Teacher Rook only told them about this competition a week before it started. After all, they don't take part in it anyway. Ayn gets up and tells Roland that okay, since class is over, he should probably go to the training ground. Roland answers Ayn well and says that he wanted to ask the teacher something else. Ayn walks through the academy and comes to the training room. He comes in and shouts to Instructor Kaiser to please take care of him today. Fencing Instructor Kaiser looks at Ayn and tells him that he came here after all, calling him a brat. Kaiser asks Ayn that he is also going to fight the buffalo on the summoning platform today. Ayn replies yeah. Kaiser leans over to Ayn and asks him if he understands that this is not normal at his age. He thinks to himself that Ayn is a confident guy. Confident guy. Ayn thinks that his examiner turned out to be a former fencing instructor. At first he was somewhat awkward, however. Ayn stands alone in the middle of the training hall, and Kaiser stands behind the glass and tells him that he has prepared everything. He asks Ayn if he has warmed up and if his armor is comfortable. Ayn thinks with a smile that the Kaiser suddenly showed his side, that is, the sweet and caring side. 
Kaiser presses several buttons on the control panel. Lightning begins to emanate from the arena floor, and then a huge monster emerges from a flash of energy into the arena. Kaiser shouts to Ayn that of course he understands that there is nothing to worry about, because the monsters on the summoning platform are unable to kill Ayn. But the monster's attacks can still knock him down. Therefore, if Ayn suddenly gets hurt, then everything will be solely on his conscience. Ayn responds by shouting that he knows this. Ayn adds that even if Kaiser says so, he has already defeated the Red Bison several times before, so this time he wants to test something. The monster attacks Ayn. The beast rushes at him, growling, and Ayn throws his sword to the side. Teacher Kaiser's mouth opens in shock. Ayn stops the monster by the horns and shouts that he wants to find out who is stronger. Ayn is shaking all over, just like the ground under his feet. And then Ayn throws the monster aside. He sighs happily and screams great. And then Teacher Kaiser hits him on the head and calls him an idiot. He shouts to Ayn about what sane person would come up with the idea of competing with a red bison. Ayn says with a smile that there are times when someone needs to stop a strong monster with their bare hands. The Kaiser shouts that in this case, wouldn't it be wiser to dodge the monster's attack rather than tempt fate and measure their strength with him? Later, Ayn sits and has lunch at a cafe with Christina. He tells her that today's training was so tiring. Chris herself tells him that he did a good job. Ayn immediately says that most likely he will not be able to take part in the Inter Academy competition. Chris herself says that if she is not mistaken, then Dill will fight the winner of the fencing competition. She asks Ayn that he might want to cheer for Dill. He replies that he will gladly cheer for him. Then he notices Lady Klein surrounded by her girlfriends. Ayn, seeing her, immediately hides back behind the chair, and Lady Klein sulks at this. Chris herself tells Ayn that it seems Klein herself was offended by him for such behavior. Ayn doesn't know what to say to this and thinks sadly that Lady Klein sat behind them. The girl tells her friends that now that she remembers this, it was nearby, the place where the crown prince saved her. Chris herself says that apparently Lady Klein was with the girl whom Ayn saved. He laughs and says what a coincidence this is. One of the girls asks Klein herself that she often visits the castle, right? Could she tell them a little about the crown prince? Another girl supports her by saying that this is a good idea. Lady Klein says that at first glance, the crown prince may seem like a problem solver, but he is one of those people who always cares about the people around him, and he is also very brave. Lady Klein says she can't tell them how happy she is to be able to stand on the same side as him. The girls are shocked and delighted by her words. They say, that as they thought, Ayn is indeed a noble prince. They ask what he usually does on the weekends. Ayn thinks that Klein said all this on purpose. Chris herself tells Ayn that if Klein is embarrassing him with her words, then should she stop her. Ayn tells her no, saying he'll just put up with it a little longer. Klein says that the crown prince gets along well with the princess, and the other day they even. But then Ayn coughs and calls Klein. He appears behind her and asks her to stop talking about it. The girls immediately stand up in shock and ask what the prince is doing here. One of them rushes to Ayn and asks to be allowed to thank him for that, because he saved her then. Ayn says that there is no need for gratitude, since he did almost nothing. Ayn asks Klein if she will come to the castle today. She replies that yes, she was just returning from class. Ayn extends his hand to her and asks Klein if she would be okay with getting back together in that case. Klein accepts Ayn's hand and asks his prince about his atonement for playing hide and seek. He answers her something like that with a smile. Lady Klein stands up and curtsies, telling her friends that she asks her to forgive her for the day. The girls answer her yes. They are quite stunned by this development. Dill Gallant is walking and then notices a group of people in the distance. He wonders what these people are doing here. They hang around the academy all day. And then one of the men turns around and Dill Gallant sees a devilish smile and fangs. Dill Gallant takes out his sword and rushes into battle, but the people are already disappearing. And the man in the cloak and his companions stand on the wall and look down at Dil Galanta. Competitions begin on the academic campus. Participants compete in various competitions. Ayn stands with Dil Gallant and says admiringly that this is the arena. Together with the square, it seems to be similar in size to a small castle. Dil Gallant bows to Ayn and tells His Highness that here he is forced to leave him temporarily. Ayn tells Dil Gallant that everything is fine. He will cheer for him at the fencing competitions. Dil Gallant tells Ayn that he is just about grateful for his highness's support. Ayn is shocked. He asks Dil about what he is worried about. Dil Gallant tells Ayn why he. Ayn immediately says with a smile that he probably just imagined it. Dil Gallant lowers his head and says that he is very ashamed that he showed weakness in front of his majesty. Ayn says that no, he would just feel better knowing that Dil Gallant was nervous too. 
he asks about and how he should understand Ayn's words. He tells Dil Gallant what he will say to him if he calls him by name. Dil Gallant says that he told Ayn about this many times already, this will not happen. This is unacceptable behavior for a regular bodyguard like him. Ayn asks about what no means. Well, he'll try his luck another time. Dil Gallant says that his answer will remain the same no matter how much he asks for it. Dil Gallant asks permission to bow before him again. Then Chris herself comes to Ayn and says that she didn't expect Dil to ever be led by emotions. Ayn calls Chris San. She leans over to Ayn and tells him that Dil confessed faster than she thought. He seems to be calm now. Ayn says that Dil never called him by name. Chris herself tells Ayn that she will accompany him to his place at the stadium. His Majesty and Mrs. Klein are already waiting for Ayn. He answers her no, saying that he still needs to go to class. Ayn tells Christina that he forgot the pen his grandfather gave him in class. This pen is very dear to him. Chris herself says that there is still a lot of time before Dill's performance, so she does not see a problem in this and will accompany him. Ayn tells her no, saying that he will return on his own. Ayn runs through the empty territory of the academy and says that it is so big, and when no one is there, it seems just gigantic. Then Ayn feels something strange. He thinks that several smells are mixed into one. This is what their street cafe smells like. Then he sees a man who talks about how everything infuriates him. He stands with his foot stepping on Roland. A man in a raincoat says that aren't the academy students having a day off today. Roland replies that he simply forgot something and asks the man what he will do with him. The man tells Roland that he doesn't need him, so he'll let him go. Roland tremblingly asks the truth and immediately exhales, saying thank God. The man smiles and lifts Roland and tells him not to forget. He's just as good like a bounty on someone's head, so he can do whatever he wants with it, right? The man squeezes Roland's neck with his hands. The man tells Roland that he is a vampire and this is very unusually true. And can he imagine that he hasn't drunk anyone's blood for several weeks now? You simply cannot imagine a more unpleasant and annoying punishment. He tells Roland that he is a man-beast. Interestingly, he had never tasted such blood before. He asks Roland for permission to drink some of his blood, and then he says that, however, he is now so hungry that he can drink all of Roland's blood without a trace. The man laughs, holding Roland by the neck. Ayn says that's why he felt like something was wrong at the academy. He approaches the man and Roland. Ayn calls the man a bastard and asks what he is doing with his friend. The man asks Ayn where the others are. Ayn replies that he just wanted to go into the classroom and get his stuff, but they attacked him and he had to deal with them. Ayn yells at the man to stop and let his friend go immediately. The man talks about how the child can defeat everyone alone, how useless his assistants are. And the man continues, saying that what he hates most in the world is when something pisses him off. And all the same, and yet how Ayn infuriates him. Ayn tells the man that if he surrenders peacefully, nothing will irritate him. The man tells Ayn not to say anything stupid, as he will never return to prison. Ayn takes out his sword and says that in this case, he will personally stop him. Ayn charges and the man throws Roland. Ayn catches his friend, and the man tells him that he is a smart guy. Ayn asks the man who he is and why he invaded the academy's territory. The man tells Ayn that he was just ordered them, that's all. One aristocrat who has a grudge against this academy. Ayn is trying to figure out who did this. The man tells Ayn to stop this crap, because if he stays here any longer, he will get stuck again and become even more irritable. Immediately the man releases a smoke screen. The man laughs, saying that Ayn should know that he is a former adventurer, but his useless guys, just like him, warned Ayn. The man attacks Ayn with a kick to the stomach. Ayn puts his hand to his side and says that he can't get used to the man's style of pain and even poor visibility. At this rate, he is in a big minus. He remembers how Chris herself told him that he shouldn't demonstrate his strength in vain. Ayn thinks that everything is true, if a man sees his strength, then however. The man wants to kill his friend. Then a man appears from the fog and shouts to Ayn that he will cut off his head and suck all the blood from him until his corpse dries up. But then something attacks the man in the face. This is Ayn, who released his magical hands, and he immediately begins to attack the man with them. And then the man's smoke clears. Ayn comes out of the fog and says that he treated Roland very cruelly. Therefore, he is obliged to neutralize the man. The same one tells Ayn that he was able to get it once and was already so sold out. Ayn engages the man using his hands. The man, in the heat of battle, shouts to Ayn that he will smash him with his left hand. But Ayn attacks the man over and over again. And he shouts to Ayn who he is and how he infuriates him. And when the man falls exhausted to the floor, Ayn runs to Roland and asks him how he is and if everything is okay with him. He comes to his senses and shouts about where the man is. Ayn smiles at him and asks him not to worry, saying that he defeated him. 
Ayn thinks that fortunately Roland lost consciousness and was not surprised by anything. Roland says that this is all strange and why the man attacked them at all. He had some reasons. Ayn says that the man said something before. Ayn says that everything is caused by an aristocrat who hates their academy. What was their plan? He recalls Dill's words about the fired teacher, that the man's behavior and ideals caused quite a lot of problems, so he was fired. He recalls that he felt several smells mixed into one. Ayn immediately has a thought. He asks Roland if he can get there himself. He answers that most likely yes. Ayn tells Roland to quickly go to the main gate and give Chris the sand there so that she can immediately come to the street cafe. Roland tries to find out from Ayn what happened, but he is already hastily running somewhere. Ayn goes to the cafe and wonders whether a person fired from the academy has the right to gracefully relax on the territory of her cafe. He sees former Professor Wolf Magnus sitting there. Wolf Magnus stands up and says His Highness the Crown Prince. He didn't think Ayn knew about him, and he doesn't remember discussing anything with him. Ayn says that he just confirmed his suspicions. He simply cannot imagine another aristocrat sharpening his grudge against the academy. Ayn asks Wolf Magnus what he is up to. He tells His Highness that he does not understand what he is saying. Ayn replies that he can smell them. He came to the cafe not only to meet him, but also to make sure that there was a large number of magical stones at the bottom of the lake. And is the professor really trying to blow up a magical device powered by magic stones? Wolf Magnus smiles. Ayn says that among his acquaintances there is one person who often causes explosions during his experiments. So this is not new for him. Wolf Magnus tells Ayn that his highness is very amazing. So quickly I realized exactly where the bomb was. But doesn't it seem to his highness that the current academy? Not even. And the monarchy itself is rotten through and through. Mere, worthless mortals flood their lands. The line between them and other blue-blooded aristocrats has almost blurred. Who knows, maybe one day they will force a gentleman like Ayn to stoop to their level. It seems to him that it is time for them to express their protest to the current monarchy. They have to prove to them who is really worthless, and to my father, and my brother, and the director of this academy. Prove it to everyone. And finally, he is obliged to teach a lesson to the son of the Gracier family, who sent him to prison. Such a lesson that he would remember it for the rest of his worthless life. Ayn asks about his and Dill's mutual dislike. Ayn shouts that he loves Ishtalika and this academy. That's why he won't leave it that easily. Wolf Magnus says that he greatly regrets that he cannot get Ayn's approval. However, he spent a fair amount of resources on this bomb. The power of its explosion is directly proportional to the quality of the magic stones. His Highness, as he thinks, what will happen if the highest quality magic stones are put in such a bomb? And she will tear the entire academy into small pieces, does Ayn agree? The reaction in the magical device has already started. No one can stop her now. And today this bomb will wipe everything here off the face of the earth. And will mark the beginning of a new Ishtalik. This is a revolution. Ayn asks about the revolution. Wolf Magnus talks about exactly what. In his hands, Ishtalik will be reborn in a true and righteous form. Ayn asks what other true species he is talking about. And Wolf Magnus says that he is deeply mistaken. Ayn rushes into battle, but the professor attacks him with magic. Ayn realizes that it was a shock wave and other magical things. But if Wolf Magnus continues to hang around there, he himself will get caught in the explosion. He's in a hurry to the next world. Wolf Magnus says that he will not die. On his clothes there are magical gems that can protect him from any explosion. From this spectator's seat he will watch the moment in which Ishtalik will be transformed. Ayn attacks the professor again and again. Ayn shouts to the professor that now he has nothing to defend himself with. And it's better for him to give up on good terms. Wolf Magnus tells Ayn that he asks him to forgive him. But he still has a whole bunch of unfinished business. But then Ayn hits Wolf Magnus in the stomach with a dagger. He shouts that this is impossible. Where does Ayn get so much strength? He tells the professor that his wish will not come true. Wolf Magnus falls, and later Ayn ties his hands behind his back. He says he needs to hurry. He takes off his jacket and is about to jump into the water. Wolf Magnus asks Ayn that he is going to defuse the bomb. One wrong move and everything will go up in smoke. Ayn doesn't answer him and jumps into the water. Ayn floats down and sees a bomb. Ayn thinks that he really cannot defuse the bomb. However, since it works from magic stones, then with his skill, he. Ayn puts his hand on the bomb and draws magic out of it. Ayn thinks about how disgusting the bomb tastes. Individually they are probably delicious, but collectively the stones are simply disgusting. Ayn drains all the magic from the stones. And later he emerges and, lying on the ground, says that he really had time. Then Chris herself runs towards him along with the soldiers and calls him. She asks Ayn that he is safe and if he is injured. 
He replies that he is fine, but seems to have eaten a little too much. Wolf Magnus says that Ayn was able to defuse the bomb so easily, as expected from his highness. Chris herself tells Wolf Magnus why he's laughing. She orders the soldiers to take him away, and she asks Ayn to tell her in detail how everything happened. Ayn says that Wolf Magnus planted a bomb at the bottom of the lake and was going to set it up. Then Ayn himself stops and says no. He begins to think about something. This is all strange. No matter how powerful the bomb was, Wolf would not have been able to achieve such goals by installing it at the academy. To actually stage a coup, he would need to get rid of the big shots in this country. And today a huge number of people gather in the academic town, including these noble people. He remembers how Chris herself told him that his majesty and Mrs. Klein were already waiting for him. How he told Dil Gallant that he would cheer for him at fencing performances. Ayn realizes in horror that this bomb is not the only one. Then Wolf Magnus hears his words and begins to laugh loudly, saying that his highness is burning and he is already late. Chris herself shouts to Wolf about where he planted the bomb. Ayn shouts that there might be a bomb in the arena. They need to hurry quickly. Chris herself stops him and says that she will go instead of him and he should go to shelter. Ayn shouts at her that he won't allow this. Only he can defuse the bomb. And if Ayn runs away, then Grandfather, Lot's San, Dill and not only them, even Klein. Chris herself is horrified and tells Ayn that she understands him. She will risk her life with Ayn and they must hurry. At this time, competitions are taking place in the arena. Dill loses his fight and misses his opponent's punch. The referee shouts round. The King of Ishtaliki tells Lloyd that the participants exchanged one point each. He angrily replies that Dill thinks there is a raven or something. The King of Ishtaliki says that perhaps Dill's rival is his childhood friend. He wouldn't say the battle was fierce. Dill looks at the stands and realizes that he is not there. His Highness did not come. He remembers how Ayn told him that he would definitely come to cheer for him. And Ayn is not one of those who does not keep promises. Dill realizes that something has happened. But Chris herself should be with Ayn, she will protect him. Here the judge announces the start of the third round. Dill enters the fray, thinking about his highness. Ayn runs through the crowd of people with Christina. Chris herself says that there are too many people near the main gate. That means there's a bomb at the back gate. Ayn replies that where exactly the bomb is in the academy, that is the problem. Ayn asks Chris San what is at the back gate. She replies that since the station appeared in the academic town, the back gate is practically not used. All that remains there is a large park and a statue of the founder. Ayn repeats her words and realizes that the bomb is there. They run to the statue, and Ayn shouts to Chris Sin that there is a strong smell coming from the bushes under the statue. But the bomb is already starting to spark. Ayn shouts that the bomb is about to explode and they won't make it in time. But then Ayn flies towards the bomb to absorb its power. He shouts that he will have time. Dil Gallant is fighting in the arena and his opponent asks him what he is looking at all the time. He shouts at Dil that he will tear him up today. And then it will become better in the academic town. And then Dil notices Chris herself and Ina in the stands. Ina yells at Dil to smash his opponent. Dil asks his enemy for forgiveness and says that victory is his. And with one blow he defeats his enemy. Everyone is happy and shocked. The referee announces the end of the round and says that the victory is awarded to Dil Gracier. The King of Ishtaliki, Dilla's father and Lady Klein are very happy. Ayn walks up to Dil and rubs his head with a smile. Later, Ayn went shopping in the castle town. Grandfather allowed Ayn to go for a walk. As a reward for dealing with Wolf, Ayn, along with Chris herself and Lady Klein, are walking along a city street. Ayn asks Lady Klein that it's okay that they bought so many outfits. She replies that these outfits look very good on him. Ayn says thank you, but he's worried about how much money they spent. They spent a lot more than he expected. Chris herself tells Ayn that he is the crown prince, so he is not supposed to wear cheap things. Lady Klein tells him that only high-ranking people should monitor finances and spend money only for its intended purpose, right? Ayn says that if so, then. And then he shudders from the cold. Chris herself asks Ayn if he has a cold. The wind from the sea is very cold. Lady Klein asks Ayn if he has a scarf or something like that with him. Ayn says that's true, and it's really getting colder, a scarf would be very useful to him. Chris herself immediately writes this in her notes. Ayn looks down and says, no matter what, the capital's port is very beautiful in shape, just like a crescent moon. But on the high seas there seems to be an awful lot of tricks. Chris herself says that when their country was first founded, its shores reached right up to these reefs. And this is exactly the shape the harbor took on after the monsters attacked. Ayn asks about the monster attack. 
and how big their army was. Chris herself says that there was only one monster. Its body was larger than their warships. He was the ruler of the seas, possessing gigantic strength, capable of controlling the waves. It was a sea dragon. Ayn and Lady Klein look at Christina in shock. Ayn asks how just one dragon could change the shape of the continent. Klein says that this is an incredible creature. Chris herself replies that everything was as they say. It sank countless boats and claimed the lives of tens of thousands of civilians. The sea dragon caused harm in the entire history of Ishtaliki, second only to the atrocities of the demon king. Klein asks Christina if the dragon has been pacified. She says yes. However, the dragon continues to appear once every hundred to two hundred years. She wouldn't be surprised if a dragon showed up in the near future. Chris herself tells Ayn and Klein to be calm. Their country's technology has advanced far beyond what it was back then and they will still continue to look for ways to confront the sea dragon. They will definitely protect Ayn and Klein. And then Chris herself asks for forgiveness, saying that they were on a walk, and she started here, and tells her not to worry. Klein backs him up, saying it was very valuable information. Ayn asks them if they wanted to go somewhere. Klein says there's actually one store she'd like to go to. Klein winks at Chris herself and asks her that she probably wants to buy something. She says yes, that's right. Klein says that then they will not put it off. They all come to the store with expensive clothes and jewelry. Chris herself says that Lalaria herself often comes here too. Ayn says that even his grandmother comes here, it's just a wonderful atmosphere. The seller expresses his respects to his highness. Chris herself and Klein say that they will go up to the second floor. Ayn says that he is still on the first floor and wants to look around. Ayn turns to the seller and says that he would also like to buy something. In the evening at the reception, the king of Ishtaliki raises his cup and speaks to the bottom. There is a celebration in the castle. The king of Ishtaliki laughs and tells Warren what a nice day, the mood couldn't be better. Ayn tells his mom that his grandpa is so relaxed today. She tells him that yes, the father puts in the most effort on this day of the year. Olivia wishes her son a happy 8th birthday. Olivia gives Ayn a pen engraved with the coat of arms of Ishtaliki. Klein gives Ayn a silver bracelet. Ayn thanks his mother and Lady Klein. Olivia asks where she is taking Christina. Ayn replies that he hasn't seen her since the beginning of the ball. Immediately Olivia and Klein begin to discuss the fact that Chris herself is such a shy person. Klein asks Ayn if you would look out onto the balcony for a minute. Ayn asks why this is. Olivia and Lady Klein tell him it's a woman's instinct. Ayn goes out to the balcony. He sees that it is snowing outside. No wonder it got so cold today. Then Chris herself comes up to him and says that this is such a coincidence. Ayn tells her that's how she came after all. Ayn asks Christina where she has been all this time. She replies that she had to help Marta San with everything. Ayn asks that Marta San isn't at the ball today instead of her work shift. Chris herself is embarrassed. And Ayn tells her that he doesn't quite understand her, but he knows one thing. She is not a good liar. Chris herself embarrassedly asks Ayn to listen to her herself. She, blushing and embarrassed, puts a scarf around Ina's neck. Chris herself tells him that she wishes him a happy birthday. Ayn embarrassedly says that this scarf. He remembers their trip to the store and says that Chris really bought it herself. She pretends that she doesn't understand what Ayn is talking about. But he tells her that she won't get away with it anymore. Chris herself asks for Ayn's forgiveness and tells him that she almost never gave gifts. So she was looking for the right moment. But she could not find a place for herself from excitement and therefore hid. Ayn smiles, and Chris takes it in her own way and asks him not to laugh. Ayn tells her no, everything is basically as he thought. In truth, he also bought something from that store. He gives his gift to Christina. She takes out a necklace from the box and says it is beautiful. Ayn tells Christina that he is grateful for everything she does for him. He also bought separate gifts for Klein and his mother, but he decided to give the gift to Christina first for all her help. Chris herself immediately tells Ayn that no, she cannot accept this. He asks her that she dares to refuse the gift of the prince's crowns. Chris herself shouts at him that it's dishonest to say that. Chris herself agrees to accept her gift with dignity. Ayn tells Christina that he will wear her scarf every day. Chris herself says that Ayn loves to tease. He replies that it somehow happens on its own when he talks to her. Chris herself looks at the pendant given to her with a smile. He's so happy. Ayn slides on the ground and shouts to someone that the monster has run towards him. Another guy jumps in and says he will deal with the enemy. The guy defeats the monster and Ayn tells him, well done Butts. He says yeah, did he see his magnificent movements? Another guy asks Butts what he's talking about. He succeeded only because his highness carefully drove the monster towards him. Butts yells at Leonard not to say that. All four of them, because of one event at the academy, arrived on a lonely island in the coastal waters of the Ishtalik mainland. 
A month ago, Teacher Ruck says that as stated in the documents he distributed to them, a hike will be organized in the new year. Ayn thinks that most likely it will be something with a tube. Teacher Ruck says that some people probably already have the wrong idea. The trips to their academy are somewhat different from the generally accepted ones. Teacher Ruck says that to participate in the hike they will need to create a squad of four people from students from both classes. Each squad will be assigned its own island. Their task is to reach the other island in three days. Next, students need to listen carefully. Monsters live on the island. In addition, they will get their own food. It is prohibited to take food, drinks, magical artifacts and weapons with you. Students need to be divided into groups independently. That's all. Ayn is shocked and doesn't understand what it is. He takes the sheet and says that it's crazy. Already in the elementary grades there was something like survival. Of course, this is the Royal Academy. He wonders where he can recruit for. But then someone calls him. This is Roland, standing with Butts and Leonard. Roland asks Ayn if he wants to join their squad. Ayn replies that he would be happy to. In the present, all four of them are walking through the forest. Butts says that he was completely blown away by this news from Professor Luke. But they have a team of excellent players, so victory is already in their pocket. Ayn has first place, Roland has fourth place, Leonard has second place, and Butts has fourth place. Ayn says that's how it is. The squad's escort, Dil Gracier, speaks to Bratz. It's too early to relax. It's not just monsters that pose a threat to them. Ayn tells Dill that they know it. Leonard tells Butts that his carefree attitude really stresses him out. Dill tells Ayn that it's getting late and they should set up camp. Ayn replies that both are true. He asks Leonard if he will set up camp. Leonard answers of course. Leonard throws a circle on the ground and begins to cast a spell. Immediately they all find themselves in the center of the magic circle. Ayn tells Leonard that he is very good at creating barriers. He replies that he thinks that the barrier should protect him from monsters from this island. Ayn says that for dinner they will have a rabbit that he caught along the way. Butts asks if there are any reservoirs with drinking water here. Leonard says no, saying it's only dirty water. Roland says that he can purify the water with artifacts. Ayn asks him if he is serious. Dill tells Roland that artifacts are prohibited. Roland laughs and says no, he will create them himself now. Roland talks about how he will set up the mana vector of the magic stone from the monster killed along the way, and will replace it with cleansing. Here Roland says that everything is ready. You need to lower the stone into dirty water. And then the water instantly becomes clear. But shouts that this is delicious. This is the first time he drinks such water. Roland says he softened the water and added minerals to it. Ayn calls Dill and asks him if it's really possible to create a magical artifact just like that. Dill says no, actually. He and Butts fight on the front lines against the monsters, with Leonard and Roland providing support. Ayn thinks that they seem to have a great team. Butts says that by the way, he recently found something. It shows fruits that look incredibly poisonous. Dill says they don't look like much, but they're actually fruit. Leonard says that such a fruit has a poisonous counterpart similar to it. Butts says yes, generally speaking. First you need to find out if the fruit is real, and only then eat it. Ayn thinks that the fruit is poisonous. Then, using his advanced poison analysis and absorption skills, he decides to quietly find out. Ayn realizes that he does not feel the change in the fruit. Ayn tells everyone that everything is fine and the fruit can be eaten. Everyone is shocked that Ayn can discern such things. He replies that he remembered how such a fruit looked in the book. Roland shouts to Ayn that he is giving. Butts says that thanks to him, they now have one more dish. Leonard says that this is all thanks to his highness. Dill looks at them and smiles. He tells everyone that we need to finish preparing and start dinner. They are roasting a rabbit. Butts says the meat looks appetizing. Leonard calls Dill to come over and eat together. He raises his hand and says that he has his own food, so they shouldn't worry about it. Ayn tells Dill that it would be a shame if they didn't eat everything, and Dill would help them. He is amazed. He says that it's good, since his highness insists, then he will share the meal with them. Dill asks permission then to add something to him. He takes out a bag of tea leaves. Leonard tells Dill that this is against the rules of the trip. He tells Leonard that he is right, but this can already be said to be a tradition and the academy turns a blind eye to her. Beats yells that Dill is serious, and he strictly followed the rules like a fool. Roland tells Bits that he did everything right. Ayn says they will be punished if they relax even a little. He will happily taste the tea. Then Beats tells Leonard that he heard that he had a fiancé. He immediately shouts at Bits why he suddenly said that. Ayn tells Leonard that he hasn't heard anything about it. Later they all sit together at dinner and have a pleasant conversation. This is how their night goes. In the morning they put out the fire and Bits happily announces to everyone that they are starting the second day of the hike. Ayn talks about how thick the fog is today. Beats tells everyone to be careful so no one gets lost. 
They walk through the forest in the fog. Roland says that it seems to him that the fog has become even thicker. Leonard says yes, he can't even see his feet. Beats asks Roland if he has any artifact to dispel the fog. He could create it, but not now. He has no materials. Roland sighs heavily and says how tired he is, if only he had trained before. He takes a step and falls into the abyss, but Ayn catches him at the last moment. He pulls Roland out of the hole and asks if he's okay. He replies that yes and thanks Ayn Kun. Ayn says that this fog is even more dangerous than he imagined. He tells Dill that he should too, and then Ayn notices that Dill is missing. He starts calling out loudly for Dill. Bits stops him from rash actions. Beats tells everyone to get ready to fight. Ayn shouts to Leonard and Roland not to go too far from him and his brother. Then they notice sparrows. But these monsters are not found on such an island. All the guys are preparing for battle. Leonard calls out to the sparrow. Roland asks Beats how strong these monsters are. Beats says that the sparrows are much weaker than the red bison she always fought at the summoning site. However, they attack in packs. But there are a lot of them. Ayn thinks that as a last resort he will use the phantom hand. But now, the sparrows are attacking them. Beats yells at Roland to avoid their tentacles. If they catch him, they will paralyze his body and lay eggs there. Ayn shouts that they should try to escape before they are surrounded. Beats shouts that Ayn is right and they will cover the others from behind. A little later, Ayn and the group manage to break away. Leonard says that by some miracle they pulled away. Bits tells Ayn that he doesn't understand that screaming loudly in this situation is tantamount to suicide. Ayn asks Bits for forgiveness. Ayn says he was just worried about Dilla and couldn't control himself. Roland says that Dil Senpai is the strongest fighter in the academy town. Everything will definitely be fine with him. Ayn tells Roland that he is right and thanks him. Leonard says that there are dangerous monsters on the island that shouldn't be here. This is an extraordinary situation. Leonard tells his highness that he is not secretly being protected by Chris herself. Ayn replies that it seems not. He heard that today she went to the capital with her mother on business. Beats says that means they need to move on. The territory of crow butterflies begins in the fog. It's dangerous to stay here too. Roland spreads out the map and tells Butts that he agrees with him too. They had already walked about half of the island, and there must have been adults at their destination. Ayn says that means they need to move as far as possible today. They will rest a little and continue on their way. Later, Ayn and the team continue on their way, and they stop for a break. But says they will camp here today. During the day we ran enough and fought off monsters. Leonard says yes, he thinks it's better this way too. Roland says his legs are about to fall off. Ayn asks Butts that he found a cave and how he thinks it is safer there. Butts says no, that's not an option. You just have to look at the pebbles at the entrance. Ayn says it's kind of purple and melts. Butts says that means she exudes miasma. In such a cave, old mana is mixed with the corpses of monsters. This place can add to their troubles. Butts says that this miasma is poisonous to everyone except those who originally lived there. For both people and monsters. Ayn says in shock that even for monsters. Roland asks Butts how he knows so much about monsters. Butts replies that his dad fought monsters in various dangerous places. So I taught him everything. Leonard says that this is the upbringing of Baron Klim. They stop for the night. Ayn remains sitting by the fire. He adds wood to the fire and thinks that this is still strange. Dill couldn't just get lost like that. After all, even Warren San guaranteed that the trip would be safe. It is unlikely that they would have overlooked such dangerous creatures as crow butterflies, if the strangeness is not in the island itself, but in the situation in which they find themselves. But then Ayn senses something. He turns his head and thinks he understands. Ayn comes to Roland and asks if he can have a minute. He wakes up and asks that it's time to change. Ayn tells him no, saying that he just wanted to ask. He asks Roland if he remembers that magical artifact that can hold water. After all, it can absorb something else besides water, like a miasma or something. Roland rubs his eyes and says yes, I guess. Ayn asks Roland if he can take one from him. He answers Ayn of course. Ayn thanks Roland and tells him to continue resting. Later in the day they run away from the crows again. But shouts about how impudent these monsters are since they attack in the morning. Ayn asks Leonard if he can ask him a question. He asks Leonard if the barrier protects him from poisons. He replies that he only protects for 20 or 30 minutes. Ayn shouts to Leonard that he calmed him down. He stops abruptly. Beats yells at Ayn what he's doing. Ayn stands opposite the monsters and asks Leonard to deploy the barrier. He does not immediately, but fulfills the request, asking to give him a little time. Bits shouts to Ayn what he's up to. Ayn replies that something came to his mind yesterday after talking with Butts. He is shocked, but then one of the butterflies entangles Butts with threads, but Ayn saves him. Here Leonard finally creates a barrier and asks for forgiveness for taking so long. 
Wadu falls to the ground and, breathing heavily, says that he was carried away. Leonard miraculously managed to create a barrier. Ayn says thank you to Leonard and tells the others to drink some water and take a break. He walks towards the exit of the barrier and Roland shouts at him what he is doing. Ayn winks at them and replies that he is going to pacify the crow butterflies. Ayn jumps out of the barrier and rushes through the crowd of monsters. He attracts monsters to himself, and then he activates the artifact received from Roland and then all the butterflies are struck by poison. The entire space around is covered with fog. Ayn stands in a cloud of smoke and gives his team a thumbs up. Beats asks Ayn why he was not affected by the miasma. Ayn replies that to be fair, he has the poison resistance skill, so he is resistant to miasma and all that. Butts talks about why Ayn didn't say this before. Leonard asks his highness to please not do such things again. Roland yells at Ayn that he was worried. Ayn says it's time for them to move on. He thinks that's all, and in the end, Ayn, Roland, Leonard and Butts continue on their way, until they finally reach the end of the road, and Dil Senpai is waiting for them there. They don't understand why. Dil stands with Christina. Dil falls to one knee in front of Ayn, calling him his highness. Dil tells Ayn that his intelligence and the way he dealt with his enemies was amazing. The rest of the guys also clearly showed their personal qualities. He had a wonderful team. Ayn asks Dil that Grandpa and Warren Sin probably set it all up. Dill tells him yes, that this is for the further development of his abilities, and with the permission of the families of his comrades, they were hiding with Christina herself to provide for them. But then someone shouts loudly to Dill. Ayn sternly asks Dill if he understands how much he made him worry. Everyone is amazed at Ayn's tone. Dill replies that yes, but all this for the sake of. Ayn says that if Dill does this again, he will rush to his aid no matter what. Dill tells Ayn that he will allow it. He is the one protecting Ayn. Ayn says that he is not yet old enough to divide people according to chain of command, and he doesn't want to become like that. Ayn tells Dil to therefore promise him that he won't make him worry like that anymore. Dil is amazed. He falls to his knees in front of Ayn and says that he humbly asks for forgiveness, but he did not think that he would cause him so much trouble. Ayn tells Dil it's good that he understood. Ayn tells Dil with a smile that since he made him worry, he will call him by. But he doesn't have time to finish, as Dil interrupts him with words that this is completely different. Ayn says what the hell, and he thought it would work this time. Dil tells Ayn that it would be rude if he called him by his first name as an apology, so he will do it on his own accord. Dil calls his highness Ayn Sama. He says he hopes to continue to serve him. Ayn is shocked and asks what. Roland, Leonard and Beats laugh, and Chris smiles herself. Tears well up in Ayn's eyes and he asks what it was. Dil said it so directly that he fell into a stupor. Ayn extends his hand to Dil and says that he allows him, but only for today. Dil says thank you very much. Chris herself tells everyone that this is the end of their trip. They need to return home to the capital. Ayn asks Chris Sin that she has been following him in the forest all this time. Chris herself answers yes, she was hiding with the help of a magical artifact. She was very scared when she caught Ayn's gaze on her. She caught a familiar smell among the magic stones of crow butterflies. But then the whole ship begins to shake. Chris herself shouts to Ayn to get off the deck. Here a crew member shouts to Christina herself that a monster has been discovered from the open sea. Chris herself and Ayn see a kraken in the sea ahead. Chris herself says that something is wrong with the kraken. Chris herself shouts to the team to get their guns ready and prepare to attack. Ayn calls Chris Sam, and then a kraken appears from the water, which is attacked by something. Chris herself hugs Ayn in defense. He opens his eyes in shock and thinks that this is something. It left a hole through a monster with one blow, much larger than their ship. Healthy fins are the size of individual creatures. Sharp and long fangs, capable of breaking a small boat with one bite. It created a huge whirlpool in the sea. And it dragged the caught prey into its center, not giving a chance to escape. Chris herself screams that this cannot be. And why him? Why is the sea dragon here? He crawls out of the water, clutching a kraken in his mouth. The dragon lets out a powerful roar. Chris herself shouts that they need to get away as soon as possible. They need to escape while the sea dragon is busy with the kraken. They float away. Ayn is trembling all over in Christina's arms. The sea dragon did not try to pursue the ship. News of him reached the capital itself. However, even after several months, he did not appear again. A year and a half has passed since the sea dragon appeared in the coastal waters of Ishtaliki. Nothing particularly important happened during this time and he simply continued to study and train routinely. Roland, Beats and Leonard say a very warm goodbye to Ayn. He waves to them and says see you tomorrow. He turned nine years old and was safely promoted to third grade. Chris Sama tells Ayn Sama that he did a good job today. She tells Ayn that when they return to the castle, 
He will again have fencing lessons and classes with Warren herself. Ayn says that then how about stopping somewhere along the way? Chris herself answers him with a smile that this is out of the question. Chris herself asks Ayn to go away with her for a minute. She straightens Ayn's tie, which confuses him. Chris herself asks Ayn that they should return to the castle. Then soldiers run towards them, calling Christina herself. She asks them what's the matter. The soldier whispers something in Christina's ear. She says it's good. She will go there right away. Ayn tries to find out from her what happened. Chris herself asks Ayn for forgiveness, saying that she has an urgent matter. And these guards escort Ayn straight to the castle. Chris herself asks Ayn not to go anywhere on the way. She immediately runs away. Ayn tries to find out from the soldiers what happened there. But they tell him that it's nothing. Ayn demands the soldiers to tell him. They say that it's good, and lay out that a monster of the level of a national disaster has appeared. Chris herself went to deal with it. Ayn says in shock that this is the monster of a national disaster. Ayn walks through the castle and everyone tells him welcome back. Ayn asks where the king is. They answer him that his majesty is in the large conference room. Ayn thinks that there are not enough knights in the castle, and everyone's face is sad. Is it really that bad? Ayn clenches his fists. Ayn abruptly opens the door and shouts to his majesty that he has returned. He finds himself in the hall where the council meeting is being held. Olivia sits next to her father and cries. Ayn rushes to his mother and asks what happened. Olivia replies that she is Chris. The king tells everyone to continue the meeting. Warren asks the king for permission to explain everything to Ayn. Warren says that a sea dragon has appeared in the waters of the port town of Magna. Ayn thinks that it's him after all. Ayn shouts that three whole years have passed. Measures against the dragon had to be strengthened. Then why such panic? Warren replies that the situation has taken an unusual turn because two sea dragons have appeared. Olivia bursts into tears. Ayn looks at Warren in shock, remembering how the Kraken died. Warren continues by saying that they can't predict how much damage they might do this time. But if they do not at least begin to act, they may remain forever at the bottom of the sea. Therefore, the supreme command was given to Chris Dono. Ayn shouts that since the situation is so serious, why only Chris Sam? They need to fight with all the forces of the castle. The king of Ishtaliki responds by telling Ayn to calm down. They have already sent all the military power they could. The strongest equipment, as well as the entire flotilla of the royal family. 90% of the knights are from the castle and even requested the help of adventurers. In such an extreme situation, only Lloyd and a few other knights are forced to remain to guard the capital's castle. He tells Ayn that besides Christina, he has no one else to entrust this case with. Ayn leaves and thinks that Grandpa didn't say anything wrong, but he cannot agree with him. There must be another way. He still has the terrible figure of the sea dragon before his eyes. His legs give way every time he thinks about it. Ayn thinks that he really wants to run away from here. Ayn addresses his majesty the king. He thinks his biggest fear is losing Chris herself. Ayn says that he will go to Magna and fight the sea dragon. The king, Warren and Olivia are shocked. The king of Ishtaliki shouts that Ayn is a dunce. What can he do alone? Lloyd tells Ayn that he is the crown prince. His body does not belong only to him. Ayn says he is fully aware of this, but he thinks that the king of Ishtaliki, as the founder of the clan, would also agree to this. Ayn says he can't just stay silent and wait. Olivia hugs her son and tells Ayn not to. He shouldn't do this. If he is sent to such a dangerous place, then she. Ayn looks at his mother as she hugs him, trembling. The king of Ishtaliki tells Ayn that despite Olivia dissuading him, Ayn still wants to go to Magna. Ayn says yes. He asks him to send him to where Chris San is now. The king of Ishtaliki sits on the throne and tells Ayn that he heard him. He joyfully calls his grandfather, but before he can finish speaking, he is knocked out by a blow to the back. It's Lloyd who stuns him. The last thing Ayn sees is his grandfather saying that it is useless to dissuade Ayn. The king apologizes to Lloyd for putting him in such an unpleasant role. He replies that it's okay, it's his job. Olivia hugs her son and shouts to her father that she did not ask for violence. The king calls Martha and tells her to take Olivia to his chambers. And he tells Lloyd to take Ayn to Kadima's room. Olivia screams loudly for her son as she is led away. The king of Ishtaliki shouts to everyone to listen to him. Ayn won't go anywhere until he gives permission. And Crown Prince Ayn should never be allowed into Magna. Ayn knocks loudly on the door, shouting demands for it to be opened. Ayn says damn, adding that he could break the door if he summoned a phantom hand, but for some reason he doesn't succeed. Ayn says with tears in his eyes that there are two sea dragons, so Chris San and everyone else can. Then Kadima asks Ayn to calm down. She tells Ayn that her room is now under a powerful seal that blocks magical energy. Only someone with Demon King class power can break this seal. 
Chadima says she understands how Ayn feels, but while she is protecting him, they should pray for Chris's health. Chadima looks at Ayn sadly. He closes his eyes and folds his hands in front of him and prays. Ayn turns to God and begs him to grant him the power to save Chris Sam. He knows that now he is powerless, but then he hears the voice of the goddess, who asks him to take a good look. Ayn is shocked to think about what that voice is. The goddess calls him a fool and says that she told him to look around. Then Ayn notices that same magic crystal. Then Ayn remembers everything. Kadima sees Ayn walking towards the cursed stone. Kadima asks Ayn to stop. Ayn asks Kadima San for forgiveness. He picks up a stone, and then all four of his phantom hands appear. Kadima screams about why this happened. The phantom hand came out despite the seal. Kadima shouts to Ayn that this stone is very suspicious. Ayn shouldn't touch him. But suddenly Kadima says that she cannot move. Ayn thinks about how he feels. It's so soft and warm. So similar to mom. Someone says thank you to Ayn and welcome back. Kadima doesn't understand what happened. She says Ayn has absorbed everything. He asks Kadima for forgiveness. Kadima asks him what he is doing and he must think about what he is doing. Ayn says everything is fine. Ayn destroys the seal with one wave of his hand. Kadima screams in shock that Ayn has broken the seal. This can't be true. She does not understand what kind of power Ayn received. She tells Ayn to stop. But he doesn't listen to her, leaving her in the room. And when Ayn goes out the door, he meets Klein there. She asks Ayn about going there. He tells her yes. Klein asks that Ayn will still do it even if she asks otherwise. Ayn says yes. Ayn says he will definitely come back. Klein calls him and kisses him on the cheek. He looks back at the girl with confusion. Klein tells Ayn that it was a blessing from the goddess. She wishes Ayn good luck. Ayn says thank you to her with a smile. Ayn runs away, leaving Klein alone in the hallway. Klein says in the post his request to Ayn to please come back alive. Ayn runs and runs into Lloyd. He is surrounded by soldiers. <laughs> Lloyd asks Ayn where he is going. Ayn replies that he wants to take a walk to the port. Lloyd says okay and takes out his sword. Lloyd tells Ayn that he is their nation's treasure. He will not allow Ayn to leave the castle. Ayn replies that he will leave anyway. Lloyd prepares for battle. But Ayn uses immobilizing magic against Lloyd and his soldiers. And so powerful that even Lloyd stopped. He understands that Ayn herself gained such powerful strength so quickly. Ayn passes by Lloyd and he calls out to him. He tells Ayn that he is going there to do what he sees fit. But he asks him not to forget all the responsibility placed on his shoulders. Ayn turns his head towards Lloyd and continues on his way, leaving the man standing in place. Lloyd sighs heavily and after a while he breaks the immobilization magic. He tells his soldiers that they too will be able to move when Ayn herself moves away. Lloyd says with a smile that honestly, what an extraordinary person Ayn is. Ayn runs out of the castle and says that he is finally outside. He lives in this castle, but what a huge castle. And what should he do now? He won't run far on his own two feet. Then he hears someone calling him and shouting that he is here. It's Dil who brought the horse. Dil gets on the horse and invites Ayn to do the same. He will accompany him on his way. Ayn thanks Dil and asks if he is sure. Dil tells Ayn that nothing will stop him, no matter what he does. Ayn tells Dil that if he helps him, then he can. Dil turns to Ayn with a smile and tells him that he serves for the good of Ishtaliki. But above all, he swore to serve Ayn herself personally. Ayn calls Dil, touched. He answers Ayn that if he is suddenly fired, he will be incredibly glad if he takes him into his service. Ayn shouts, of course. They sit the horse into a gallop and set off. They gallop around the city when Dil tells Ayn that he can take him to the White Rose Station. But then he will have to change to the water train to Magna. Otherwise they will waste a lot of time. Ayn asks Dil if he will be allowed to board such a ship. Dil tells Ayn that it will be difficult. His majesty gave the order not to let Ayn into Magna. Ayn shouts damn, what to do now? If they hesitate, then Chris Sam. Dil interrupts Ayn, saying there is only one way. They will be saved by an order from a member of the royal family. Ayn asks about the order. Dil replies that it is an absolute right that only members of the king's family have. Ayn, as crown prince, can issue an order that will override the usual order of his majesty. However, due to the high legal force of the Ongo, its application will subsequently be subject to review. If he is deemed inappropriate in the process, the worst case scenario is that Ayn will be expelled from the royal line. Dil says he hates to admit it, but he doesn't think it's a good idea. Therefore, it is better to choose. Ayn shouts that he understands. Then they have nothing left to do. They will travel by water train. Ayn smiles and says thanks to Dil for the information. Ayn and Dil race on the water train to- At this time, a battle with sea dragons is taking place in Magna. But monsters destroy Ishtaliki's ships like they were toys. Chris herself orders her people not to retreat. The sea dragon's magic stone is located in its forehead. 
Chris herself shouts that to win, you just need to break this stone. Soldiers readily accept orders from their commander. Chris herself thinks in anger that less than half of their forces have survived, and only one dragon inflicted such losses on them. If they delay, there will be nothing left of them. They need to stop the first dragon first. A soldier watching the dragons with binoculars shouts to Chris herself that the dragon is resurfacing. Chris herself tells her people to prepare for a massive attack, and immediately the guns are prepared and the magicians cast spells. The dragon rushes at all speeds towards the ship. The dragon flies out of the water and roars. Chris herself gives the order to open fire. The cannons fire at the monster. Many projectiles hit the dragon and it roars in pain. Some of the projectiles hit the dragon's head, breaking his magic stone. He roars in pain and falls into the water, bleeding. The soldiers seeing this joyfully shouted hooray, they broke the magic stone. Finally they, Chris herself shouts at them not to relax and maintain their positions. A dragon immediately appears from the water and destroys the ship in a few seconds. Immediately the dragon creates a huge wave in the water. Chris herself sees the destruction that a defeated dragon brings and thinks that even with a broken stone on the verge of death, a monster does this. Chris herself thinks that there is one more undefeated dragon left. And then he appears from the water behind her. She turns around in shock, realizing that this is the end. Chris herself thinks that she would like to hear Ian's voice one last time. Chris herself draws her sword and summons magic, screaming at the dragon to come to her. But then fog appears between her ship and the sea dragon. Chris herself doesn't understand where the fog around the dragon came from. Then Chris notices Ayn herself. Chris herself shouts to Ayn what he is doing here. He tells her that he limited the sea dragon's field of vision with the thick fog skill. Chris herself shouts at Ayn herself that she didn't mean it that way. Chris herself asks Ayn Sama why he came here. He needs to return to the capital immediately. Ayn herself tells Chris herself that in the name of Ayn von Ishtalik as she gives the royal decree. Ayn shouts that he will fight the sea dragon and they will all be engaged in supporting the rear. Ayn is determined. Chris herself asks about the royal decree. Chris herself asks Ayn herself if he even understands what the royal decree is for. Ayn herself tells Chris herself that she has no right to contradict the orders of the crown prince. She must do what she is told. Chris herself understands that Ayn herself has the same look as then. Chris herself says that this is a royal order. She's shaking all over. Ayn herself tells Dil that he is leaving the ship to him. He falls to one knee and says that he is obeying. Then someone shouts that the dragon is coming. The dragon bursts out of the fog and roars. Ayn herself shouts to the monster that from now on only he will fight the sea dragon. Ayn herself summons her phantom hands and attacks the beast. Chris herself shouts to Ayn Sama that she would not advise him to go against the dragon alone. Ayn shouts back at her that who said this would work. He stops the monster with his phantom hands. Chris herself is shocked and says that Ayn did it herself. He stopped the sea dragon. Ayn herself is breathing heavily and says that training with the red bison was not in vain, no matter what instructor Kaiser says. Ayn breaks through the dragon's face with his own hands. Ayn climbs onto the dragon's body. Ayn thinks about the magic stone in the forehead of the sea dragon, if only he knew where it was. Ayn herself screams that she would absorb this stone, even at the cost of her death. Ayn herself attacks the dragon again, and Chris herself screams at him, calling him again and again. The sea dragon drags Ayn herself to the bottom. Ayn herself thinks that this is the reason for the sea dragon and the king of the seas. A normal monster's magic stone would be absorbed in a matter of seconds. No matter how much he absorbs the stone, it does not end. Ayn herself shouts to the dragon that it will be as he wants. It will continue to absorb stone even underwater. And the one who holds out until the very end will win. Ayn herself thinks that let the dragon give up already. Due to the phantom hand and the water pressure, his defense, mana and oxygen are already at their limit. Ayn herself thinks that his strength is running out, and mana is already at its limit. He still has power, top class power right in front of your nose. Ayn herself thinks that he will turn the energy of the absorbed magic stone into mana. Ayn herself absorbs more, even more. The dragon growls in pain. Ayn herself thinks that great, he still has a little time left to win. But then Ayn herself breaks away from the dragon, thinking that he has very little left. Ayn herself remembers her entire family, all her close people. He thinks that this is not the end, taking out his dagger. He shouts that this is it for the sea dragon and plunges his dagger into the magic stone in the sea dragon's head. The dagger pierces the stone and a crash is heard. The dragon sinks to the bottom, and Ayn floats to the top herself. Dil asks about the sea dragon making that roar. But then he hears someone taking off their armor. This is Chris herself. People joyfully celebrate victory. The soldiers hug, 
and Chris herself drags the unconscious Ian herself onto the deck and hugs him with tears in her eyes. Ian herself is in the arms of a smile that he was able to protect. Chris herself cries with joy that Ian herself is alive. 